All right. Shabbat Shalom, family. Welcome to Prophecy Ministries for our Sabbath day Bible study. Uh, on each table, there is a microphone. And when you were talking into the microphone, please do not cup the top of the microphone like a wrapper. Do not hold the very bottom of it because that's where the transmitter is and it will start to pop and click. You're going to hold the microphone right there. You're going to hold it about four inches from your mouth and talk loud and clear. If we can't hear you in the room, then they can't hear you on the internet either. Everybody got it? You can leave the microphone on uh, and just leave it on your table. That being said, somebody pray for us. Somebody with the microphone pray for us and we will jump into the Bible study. Father Abba, we're going to thank you for bringing us here today to learn your word, to get understanding, to be better followers of you, Father. Pray that we get understanding. In Yahweh Shai's name, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. I got a question going back to the Wednesday Bible study on Romans 14 through 19, and 13 will cover at the end. Romans chapter 14? Yeah. 14 through 19. Oh, I'm sorry. Romans chapter what? 14. 14, 14. All right. Go ahead. There was um, something I heard about. Did you share the stream? Something about pork and the intent of this verse, uh, these verses here. And I just wanted to make sure that I was correct on what it translates into. Hold the mic up. About what it's supposed to translate into. I'll get into some of these words here were interesting. Um, on four, if we start at 14, it says, I know and I am persuaded by Adonai Yahawashai that there is nothing unclean of itself. We know it's not pork, right? Because, um, but if him that esteemeth. But to him. But to him that esteemeth and anything to be unclean to him, it is unclean. So when I went into esteemeth and looked up that, that was a totally different understanding of that word, which was when I used that app, when you're talking about pushing onto it and looking at it, it's a inventory or to count. There's a bunch of translations. It's a literal or figurative uh, word, right? And then we, we get into this one, starts breaking into a couple other things I didn't know. It says, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy him not with thy meat, for whom Christ died. When I clicked on the meat, it means either food literally or figuratory. So let's talk about this. Uh, what does literally mean? Um, so literally, the root of this word is lit, literal, which means as it is written. So it, it is exactly as it is written, but what does figuratively mean? mean? Say, say that again. It has a deeper meaning. It's allegory. It's, fi it's a figure of speech. Like the meat of the word, right? Our word is The our meat of the word is right. figurative. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, yeah. it's not actually the steak of the word, but right. it's, okay, that's perfect. Right. And so... You will find a lot in the Greek language that it is speaking both literally and figuratively because Greek is an abstract language, whereas Hebrew is a concrete language. Most of the things in Hebrew, it's going to say literally okay, or causatively. But in the Greek, there's more than way one way to understand this. When we talk about Greek, we're talking about philosophers, Plato, and all of these so-called great thinkers, and a lot of their thinking was very figurative, comparing one thing with another thing. Right. Go ahead. Right. So when it talks about um, that with being grieved and walking around without charitably, right? So when you look at the, the reading food, right? So we know it's not pork. We know it's not shellfish. We know because pork is not food. Correct. That's right. So what they're talking about would be like if you have uh, your meat, right? And they're like, that's not cooked all the way, right? Mm -hmm. And that's blood right there. And somebody's like, well, that's hemoglobin, right? I don't even know how to spell that. <laughs> okay. That's blood, right? Yeah. Or it could be uh, uh, somebody that thinks about uh, fish with antibiotics, right? Or somebody that's eating unserved soybean to their, to their boys, right? And causing unnecessary estrogen in their children, right? In their men. Um, 
somebody would say you're making GM, GMH, right? Genetically, genetically modified humans. And so mm -hmm. that could start an argument, right? Is that literally, or that would be figuratively? That would be figuratively. Right. When you're taking out of its, when you're taking anything out of its primary context and using it in an allegorical manner, right. it's figurative. So that would be figuratively. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody were to be walking around saying, nah, right, and arguing about that, that could get into um, this now where it says, let then not your good be evil spoken of, right? Because now that can cause a conflict, mm -hmm. right? So it says, thy kingdom of Yah is for not meat, for the kingdom of Yah is not meat and drink. And that meat right there was a uh, same thing, but a little bit more of a definition, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For the for he that is for he that things, in in these things, for he that in these things serve Mashiach mm -hmm. is acceptable to Yah and approved of men. Let us follow after the things which make for peace, and anything where with one many may edify another. That edify was something. It was a compound of two which was structure and figuratively confirmation. And I never knew that that edify means to confirm or a structure, right? Um, so everyone hold your finger down on the word edify. Let me uh, help to expand on what he's showing us. When you're reading the Strong's definition, you read straight through even though there is brackets and there's other information, you take the Strong's definition and you read it as a complete sentence. So this word edify, this is the feminine abstract form of the word. Feminine abstraction of a compound, which is two other words, and it tells you those two other words in their Greek meaning. And the base of this other word, so it says architecture. Edify in relation to ar architecture means to build right? That is concretely a structure. So that is the actual meaning of edify, the concrete meaning. If we saw this word in Hebrew, edify simply means to build. Okay. Um, figuratively confirmation. Does it actually mean confirmation? No, it does not. But it can be used as a figure of speech to give a confirmation. That's what happens when uh, Brother Darius is saying something and Brother Greg adds a precept to it. His precept is for the purpose of edifying and it, it confirms what he was saying. Right. Okay, okay, keep going. Okay, so and then it says, and if we go back to 13 now, is, is what I wanted to go back to 13. And this will be just to make sure I had it right that it wasn't anything to do about pork. The, it says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Right? Okay. So this getting into this um, passage here is about causing your brother to stumble. Correct? That is correct. This, this whole passage. The whole thing. And that's what we discussed on Wednesday during the Bible study that none of this had anything to do with eating unclean food. There is no such thing as unclean food. Okay. Either it's food or it's not. So lobster and shrimp, that's not food. So it's not unclean food. It's not food at all. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. All right. I just want to clarify. Yeah. It's not food for us. Right. It's not food for us. Yeah, but to a lion, if a lion finds a, a pig, he's like, yeah, I'm going to eat. That's what he means when he says there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So who was the person who decided what was clean and what was unclean? That was Yah. So I don't get to go back and change. Well, I think this is clean now. So I'm going to eat a mountain lion. That doesn't make any sense. Amen. Thank you for sharing. So that's good because we covered this on Wednesday and then you had to go home and dig into those words to get a deeper understanding of it. Because I had shared that the day before. Mm, amen. Yeah. What you got, Mike? New question. New question. Can we talk about tabernacles, booths? What is a booth? What is a temporary structure? Mm. Uh, and kind of discuss the, the purpose of dwelling with uh, Yahweh and 
that time, what it's meant for. Amen. Okay, uh, Leviticus chapter 23. Whenever we want to find any information about the feast days, we always go to Leviticus 23. Are you asking because you want to know if an RV is an acceptable dwelling place for tabernacles? Not an RV, but a pop-up tent. Okay. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 39. No, let's start this one at verse 34. There's two sections in Leviticus that both talk about the Feast of Tabernacles. 34? 34, go ahead. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto Yahweh. Who thinks that's July 15th? Good. That is not July 15th. Even though it says the fifteenth day of the seventh month, According to the calendar, the modern day calendar, what does that sound like? That sounds like July 15th. It is not July 15th because July is not the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar. Okay. Neither is the 15th of the month, the 15th day of the month, counting from the new moon. So if you were to just read that uh, literally, exactly what it says, you wouldn't understand it you'd have to find out what calendar are they using. Once you understand what calendar they're using, then you would be able to go back and say, I have to do that literally on the seventh month on the 15th day. So it's very concrete in Hebrew. Okay, it's the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. Hold your finger down on the word Tabernacles and go to Strong's. We're looking for the Hebrew word, which is pronounced Sakah. There is no U in ancient Hebrew, so it's pronounced Saka. What does it mean? Go to Strong's definition. A hut or lair. Booth, cottage, covert. What does covert mean? Hidden. Pavilion, tabernacle. What's the last one say? Okay, is there any problem with me dwelling in a tent? No, there's not. Okay, let's go to the Brown Driver Briggs definition. It says thicket. What is a thicket? That's where I kick it. I kick it in a thicket. Okay. The thicket is a bunch of branches or bushes. Thicket, covert, booth. Thicket, booth. Rude or temporary shelter. It is not a permanent shelter. Rude meaning it's man-made. It's just put together really quickly. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Let's go back. Short from rudimentary. Rudimentary. That's good. Okay, now read verse 35, please. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no, no servile work therein. What does convocation mean? Yeah. Coming together. Holy gathering on the first day. How many days are we doing this for? Eight. Okay, this is, this is where it's a little bit tricky. It says it's a total of eight days. But he says you celebrate it for seven days. There is another holy day at the end of tabernacles, which is called the eighth day. You only sleep in the tabernacle for seven days. Okay? And you shall do no servile work. What does that mean? Mm, okay, so Brother Darius said no work for money. What, is, what does servile mean? Servile means any work that is not related to the feast. That's what it means. It doesn't matter if you're getting paid or not. So, like, watch. If we have a feast and... Brother Greg decides that he's going to cook some bomb tacos and he's cooking for all of us. That's going to be some work. Setting up the tables, that's going to be some work. Clearing the place afterwards, all of that is going to be work. And all of that is allowable to do because it pertains to the feast. But if he decides, well, I'm going to do my laundry. I don't have nothing to do with the feast. You can't do that. That's servile work. So that's what it means. Now, the Bible makes two different definitions. It'll say, thou shalt do no work. What does that mean? None, period. So the Sabbath is no work at all. The, uh, these other ho high holy days are no servile work. What happens if this thing falls on the Sabbath? If the first day of, of tabernacles falls on the Sabbath? 
extra day of preparation. Yes. An extra. I have to show up a day early to set everything up because I can't do no work. Does that make sense? The Sabbath takes precedence over all the rest of the holy days. All right, here we go. You shall do no servile work therein. Verse 36. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. Okay. Do we still make offerings made by fire? Because that's called a burnt offering. And a burnt offering is an animal sacrifice. And we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Why not? Because Yahweh Shai did complete the work. Because Yahweh Shai was the final perfect sacrifice. Anyone who celebrates Passover and they kill and cook a lamb, it's blaspheming. Because Yahweh Shai is the lamb and we should not be sacrificing animals anymore. Does that make sense? Let's keep going. On the eighth day. Oh, you got a question? Go ahead. Talking to Mike. I did. So does that mean we don't eat the lamb either? We don't eat the lamb. Like, well, I mean, well, okay. So watch. Where are you going to get the lamb from? Walmart. Well, if, Walmart. Okay, so well, let's say I find a place that has like, um, like, okay, well, then it's sacrificed and it's the right. Okay. It's still sacrificed, but right. you're going to have to find a place that has a he lamb that's one year old without blemish. A perfect lamb that is exactly one year old. And there's no way that we can know for sure. If there's no way you're going to know. Unless we do it ourselves. And then if we did it ourselves, then, that's then blasphemy. blasphemy. That's right. Because right. you'd have to sacrifice that lamb in order to keep the holy day. And that's, yeah. So we don't eat lamb. On Passover, you're not going to do that. But if you want to have lamb for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you can have lamb. Yeah, you can eat lamb. But it's just not on the Passover on that specific day. Amen. Okay. Yes. Noted. Yeah. Let's keep going. Seven days. Um, se um, <clears throat> on the eighth day shall be a holy, an holy convocation unto you. So it just said seven days I do this thing. And on the eighth day, I'm supposed to get together with my people again. Am I still celebrating tabernacles on the eighth day? No, I'm not. What am I celebrating? The eighth day. What does eight represent? New beginnings. New beginnings. Okay, keep going. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. It is a solemn assembly. Pause there. Okay, the eighth day is different than the seventh day. Those seven days, those are a holy convocation. The eighth day is a solemn assembly. It's higher than the rest of the days. Does that make sense? It's called the great day of the feast. Let's keep going. And you shall do no servile work therein. Okay, I can't do no work that does not pertain to the feast. Now, jump down to verse 39. This is so important that uh, what two verses later, he's going to repeat himself to make sure that you clearly understood what he said about the Feast of Tabernacles. Hold on. I have a question. Go. Sorry. So the Som solemn assembly is higher than all the other uh, days. Does that mean it's higher than the Sabbath? When Not higher than the Sabbath. The mm -hmm. Sabbath is a solemn assembly. Okay. Yeah, the Sabbath is a solemn assembly. Um, the three times of per year that we have to show up, what are they? Passover, eighth day, and uh, um. so it's not actually Passover. Passover is only a meal; it's not a day. Unleavened bread, unleavened the feast bread. of unleavened bread, Pentecost, Pentecost, Tabernacles, Tabernacles. Those are solemn assemblies. Go ahead. Also, in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto Yahweh seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath. Pause there. Can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. You say tabernacles, but it's actually the eighth day, which is after tabernacles, right? The eighth day is after tabernacles. So just so that everyone understands what that looks like, we are going up to the porch. We're setting up all of our tabernacles. We're going to dwell there in tents for seven days. We're going to wake up that morning. We're going to come home. We're going to get showered. And on the eighth day, we will be here in the church having our solemn assembly here in this building. You do not sleep in a tabernacle on the eighth day. Now, so the eight, so it, the first day of tabernacle is the day that is commanded, mm -hmm. not the eighth day. I mean, they're all commanded. They're both, but, both of them right, are. Right, but the three days that you were speaking of a moment ago are the first day of tabernacle, day of Pentecost, and the eleventh. No, no, it's the feast of tabernacles, feast. not one of the specific days. So here's what's interesting about both of those times: the one in the beginning of the year, which is the feast of unleavened bread. How many days does it have? Seven days, eight days. It has seven, but it really has eight because there's Passover plus seven. 
and then we have our Pentecost, which represents the middle of the year, and then at the end of the year, at this time, we have our Feast of Tabernacles, which is seven days plus one also. So we share the, it shares the same pattern. The it's same the same pattern. pattern. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. And so when he says for you to show up, he doesn't expect you to go a mile and then leave. If any man compels thee to go a mile, what is what do you should go to? You go twain. You stay the whole time. Prepare to be there. You can't be like, well, I showed up on the first day, which was a holy convocation, but I didn't show up on the eighth day. If you do that on purpose, that's disobedience because he commanded you to show up on the eighth day. Make sense? Okay. What do you now, call that when the first part of a verse and matches the second, like the last part, like of that it? A chiasm. So you could look at these feasts like a chiasm because mm -hmm. it's Passover and then seven days and then yeah. tabernacles for seven days and then the right. Day. And so remember, we can spread those out over the menorah to make the chiasm work and see how they're connected. So we have our. Passover, which is Passover and unleavened bread, right? And then we also have our tabernacles at the end. And then we have, what do you guys think the second one is? So technically the, the first one is Passover and then unleavened bread. Here's the one that's tricky. Everyone thinks this is first fruits. There is no commandment in the Bible to celebrate first fruits. You celebrate Pentecost. You celebrate your first fruits on the day of Pentecost. And then we get to the halfway marker, which is what is after that? Trumpets. It's all warning out from this part out. You get to your trumpets as a warning, and then you get to your day of atonement, then you get to your tabernacles, and then you get to the very end, which is the eighth day. Got it? Yeah. What you got? Talking to Mike. No? Just working it out. Okay. Well, you had something? See if they, they did it right. I checked theirs. Yeah, I, I saw that. Can I add? Yes. Um, so for the seventh month, if you want to reference First Kings 8, 2, it'll for, tell you the name of the month. Amen. First Kings chapter 8, verse 2. Let's take a look. Okay. It says, and all the men of Israel assembled themselves under King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Now watch this. Everybody has an asterisk next to Ethanim in your app. Touch that asterisk and it'll tell you when it is. It's between September, it's between September and October, and it will always be at the halfway point of each one of the months. Because the new month begins at the first light of the moon. So when we get to the full moon, that means it's the halfway mark between two months. So the halfway mark has to put you between September and October. When they tried to simplify it, they shifted everything to the left and they jacked up the whole calendar. Okay, thank you for sharing that precept. Let's go back really quickly to our Leviticus 23, 38. Uh, 39 there's something interesting that happens in verse 39 it says that first day shall be a sabbath okay i need to show you the difference between two words because everybody knows what sabbath means what does it mean rest, rest. hold your finger down on the word sabbath in verse 39 take a look at the transliterated word what is it that's not sabbath is it that's sabbathon Okay, now we're not going to look at the definition right now. Scroll backwards in this same chapter to verse 3. Leviticus 23, 3. It says, Six, barakata, barakata. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. Hold your finger down on Sabbath in that verse. They're not the same word, are they? It's the same word in English. Both of them are Sabbath, but they're not the same thing in Hebrew. This Shabbat is different than the Shabbaton. Everybody see the difference between those two words? Same word in English, different word in Hebrew. What you got? Uh, so it says in the Brown uh, Driver Briggs, Day of Atonement. For which? It, for the Sabbath. Because the Day of Atonement is a Sabbath. It's not always. Okay. We're going to have to come back to that because I got a question about that. Okay. Okay. So 
scroll back now. We're looking for the Shabbaton. So we're going back to 39. Hold your finger down on Sabbath in verse 39. Shabbat one. What does it say for the Strong's definition? It's from Sabbath, but it is a Sabbatism or special holiday. Make sense? Sure. Rest and Sabbath. The Brown Driver Briggs says Sabbath observance, Shabbatism of weekly Sabbath, Day of Atonement, sabbatical year, Feast of Trumpets of the first and last days of the Feast of Tabernacles. If that fell on the seventh day, would you call it a Shabbat Shabbaton? You would. You would call it a Shabbat Shabbaton. And you would do no work at all. Make sense? Talking to Mike. So if it fell on an a the actual Sabbath day, yeah. then you would do nothing. You would prepare the day before that yes. to do all the things. That's right. All right. The Sabbath and all of the holy days are about obedience first, preparation second. We have to be obedient and we have to be prepared. Anybody who thinks that you're going to get out of uh, the exodus into the mountains and then into the wilderness without preparing is not reading what the scripture says they're not learning the lesson when when there was manna on the ground remember when we used to rain manna he told us at that time you better get prepared go out there and gather twice as much because tomorrow there won't be any that's teaching you that you need to start stocking up on all of the important items that you have because there's going to come a day when you're not going to have those things all a dress rehearsal it's so all a dress rehearsal, right? Dress rehearsal. So what's the difference between a rehearsal and a dress rehearsal? You actually get dressed for the costumes. In both places, you run through it, right? Oh, but see, so if you think of it as a costume, then you don't see the right picture. It's you being in the suit, right? You have to be in Christ. You have to put him on. That's the dress rehearsal. I'm getting dressed for this wedding. So now I look the part and I'm acting the part. Amen. Amen. All right. Let me see. Uh, verse 40 will give us our booths. And you shall take you on the first day the bows of goodly trees. What's a bow? Branch, branch. Branches. The branches of goodly trees. Go ahead. Branches of palm trees. Uh huh. And the bows of thick trees. Uh huh. And willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh, your Allah Hayyam, seven days. Okay, what did it say I was going to do with those bows? It oh, didn't yeah. say nothing to do with the bows, did it? It didn't tell me what I was going to do. What am I going to do with them? You'll make a house. I'm going to make a shelter. Why? Because there was no Walmart for me to go buy an Ozark trail tent at that point. So how was I going to make a booth? The Sakah literally was braided branches together that I would use to make a temporary dwelling place. But the meaning of the word is tent amen now you have a couple different options if you have a tent feel free to use a tent because the word tent is in there that's what it means if you decide that you don't have a tent and you're gonna chop down some branches and you're gonna braid them together and you're gonna make a temporary structure that's probably a good idea because there may come a time in the wilderness when you don't have a tent but you do need to know how to make a temporary structure to keep you safe for the night does that make sense if I do one and not the other, is there a problem? No, both of them are covered in there. Here's the issue. Now, if I roll up in my RV <laughs> and I got my system bumping in the air conditioning blasting, it, is, it, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? No, sir. No, I am you not. You are not preparing. I am not preparing. Okay. One more verse in here. Verse 41. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. That was loud. Um, I have a preset for verse oh, 40. Excellent. It is Psalm chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 Psalms chapter 1 verse 2 but his delight is in the law of Yahweh and in his law doth he meditate day and night mm -hmm. and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in season his leaf shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper hmm and so um, we have a tree, we have water, fruit, and a leaf. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you for sharing that. 
we're back in Leviticus 19, no, Leviticus 23, 23, and we're at verse, what? 41. 41. It's only two more verses we need to cover on this. And you shall keep, <clears throat> and you shall keep it a feast unto Yahweh seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Okay, what's a generation? What's a generation? So, if there's you and there's your mom, that's two generations. If there's you, your mom, and your grandmother, that's three generations. So, what is a generation? It's every time your genes reproduce. That's what it means. The root of this word generation is gene. Every time your genes reproduce, you celebrate this thing. So, who did you learn it from? Your parent. Who are you supposed to teach it to? Your child, and they're going to teach it to their child and train up a child in the way that they should go. Doesn't that make sense? Okay, now watch. It says it shall be a statute forever in your generations. How come we stopped doing it? Deception. Yeah, deception. Right? Football. Football? Football? How so? <laughs> Disobedience. <laughs> captivity? The disobedience put us into captivity, and the captivity made it so that we didn't remember all these things that we were commanded to do. Confusion of face. Confusion of faces. That's right. Because for the longest time, we thought they're the children of Israel, and we are Gentiles. Most of us thought we was Africans. Some of us thought that we was Spaniards. Don't bring that up. Oh, my bad. My bad. <laughs> Give me verse 42. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. Okay, and we know that the word booth means saka. Saka. Seven days. How many days? Did it say you shall dwell in booths eight days? It's the reason why we have to read it exactly what it says. We're going to get together on the first day. We're going to get together on the eighth day, but we're only dwelling in booths for seven days. That means that this eighth day is something different than the rest of those days. Finish reading that verse. That your generations may know. No, I'm sorry. It said, all that are Israel. Go back. Okay. All, all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. If you are a blood-born Israelite, you have a commandment to dwell in a booth. Does that, does that make all of the strangers and the sojourners free from that? No, you shall be as one born in the they land. They shall be as one born in the land. So everybody i don't care if you were raised and you still think you're a christian you have to do these things the god of the israelites and the god of those who call themselves christians is the same god you guys know that right never admit to there being more than one god if you know him there is one god does that make sense everybody understands that you can't be like well you're god if if i have a god and you have a god then there's two gods and that's blasphemy coming out of your mouth so just because they serve Yah a certain way and you serve him a, a different way doesn't mean that there's two different gods there's two different understandings about him there's two different relationships our relationship is based on obedience and faith theirs is just faith right and you guys know faith without is what is dead okay now watch we were supposed to be doing this ever since we were children for seven days we dwell in booths verse 43 that your generations may may know that i made the children of israel to dwell in booths mm -hmm. then i brought them out of the land of egypt i am yahweh your allah okay amen any other questions regarding tabernacles that we need to cover so yes Somebody say okay. yes. Where are you at? Here. Hello. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so, confirming. So, we have to go these seven days mm -hmm. and sleep in tents. So, what if you don't go? Um, if you can't go is different than if you don't go. Can't and won't are two totally different things. So, let's say your health prevents you from going because you might be on a respirator. What does the Most High do? He winks at you right um, but what if you're like I don't want to sleep out there in the dirt and the sun and there's bees and tarantulas as big as my dog I don't want to do that disobedience that's disobedience are there really tarantulas though say that again are there really tarantulas out there there just, really are tarantulas just have out Tom there. come move it yes 
EBR. Yes, uh, there's tarantulas. Wait, Some, somewhere uh, along the way, I had an understanding that a booth, don't start uh, Sukha, or... Say that again? Uh, it, as I understood before of a, a Sukha or a booth, it only had three walls. There was actual... Oh, that's Jewish. So that's, that's Jewish? That's okay. Jewish. Because it doesn't say it that. It does not say that in here. It does not. It does not. So, uh, you could have, if I had a palms. TP, it's yeah. only going to have one wall. It's going to wrap right. around the whole thing. Yeah. So there's no requirements to how many walls. It just needs to be a temporary structure. So uh, a pop-up tent. That you set up. That, right. That's set up. That's a temporary structure, but an RV bumping with the AC yeah. rolling in. That's that ain't temporary. preparing you for nothing. That's not, yeah, that's not a yeah. dress rehearsal no. of any kind. <laughs> no. Unless you're a diva, you're like, I got my own personal dressing room. What if you have an RV, <laughs> but you set up a tent next to it? Okay. You have an RV. You set up a tent next to it. Where do you dwell? In the tent. In the tent. And when it gets too hot, you be a diva and you go in your RV with a sign on the door that says, do not disturb. It might just be nice to have a place to it, go to the bathroom. It's, that's a great idea. The important thing is that we keep the commandment, which is dwell in this tent for seven days. When we first started this, when we first started doing tabernacles, we would just put a sheet up over our bed. And then the second year, we put tents in the church. And then we rented a place and we went out and actually started preparing. Yeah. Yeah. So to answer that question, if you're unable to go, then you can be at home and you will put a sheet or something over your bed that um, resembles or signifies that this is a tabernacle. Mm -hmm. So you can do that if you're unable to go or whatever the case may, may have you. Um, outside of that, if you don't wanna go, that's nothing we can answer. That's between you and the most high. You have to pray about that. Um, I'm gonna step back when the lightning strikes though. <laughs> um, yeah. Right, but you do have an alternative. <laughs> if you cannot go, put a sheet, something over your bed for those seven days. And that is a representation of you still being obedient to the most high because you're representing that's your tabernacle. One of the most powerful things about celebrating tabernacles is it's seven days and you get out of your family and you get into the family. Most people, it's like when you go to tabernacles, that first day, it's uncomfortable. That second day, you're like, oh, this, I, I don't know, this is kind of weird. By day three, you're like, I could do this. By day four, you don't remember what day home. it is, and you're like, I never want to go home. I could live like this the rest of the time. Day seven, you're like, I can't believe seven days has gone by so fast. Yeah, so it's, it's a transformation time. Yeah. And you will learn more in those seven days. Like, imagine you're spending seven days, and all you got to do is just ask a question, and somebody's available to... We do Bible study for hours every single day of Tabernacles. So it's like a boot camp. Right? Amen. Amen. Go to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 14. This is still on the same subject of the booths, the Sakah. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 14. Go ahead. And all the congregation, Nehemiah chapter 8, and verse 14. And they found 14. written in the law, which Yahweh hath commanded by Moses, that the children of Yasharala should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Okay. They found it's written in the law that we should do this. When they found out that it was written in the law, what did they do? Say, no, nah, we're not going to do that. That's old. They immediately said, well, let's get these trees together. Go ahead. Verse 15. And that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount, and fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees, to make booths, as it is written. See, that last verse, this is the reason why it's a precept. The last verse did not tell you what to do with all those branches. This one tells you, you use the branches to make your booths. Verse 16. So the people went forth, and brought them, and made themselves booths. Every one upon the roof of his house, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of Yah, and in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. So at that time, they didn't go camping in the wilderness. They put up a tent anywhere they could put up a tent. Brother, up there on a roof in a tent. 
but he wasn't down there dwelling in his house. He was being obedient to the commandment. So if you cannot make it to go camping, if you're watching online and you live in Arkansas or Georgia or wherever you live and you're like, I really wish that I could make it to Tabernacles in Phoenix. If you cannot, you still keep the Feast of Tabernacles right where you are in your own place. Amen. Like you might have to go to Walmart and get a tent and put that tent in your backyard. Right. Huh? I said we did that last year. You did that last year? We did that last year. Did we do it the year before too? Yeah, we did the year before oh. too. And because my backyard is literally just desert land, there's like nothing there. Amen. Um, well, we coming to your backyard. I'm just playing. I, I mean, hey, <laughs> there's so much space. So you're more okay. than welcome to. Okay. So yeah, we did all of that. And that was the most amazing thing. Amen. Give me verse 17. And then I think we can move to another. But, I mean, 17 and 18. Because Nehemiah is the Tershatha. He's the governor. He's he's basically the law man, and he very much knows the difference between the seven days of tabernacles and the eighth day. And he's going to mention both of them in this verse. Go ahead, verse 17. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths. Pause right there. When we come again into the land of Israel, out of the captivity that we're in now, we are going to be dwelling in booths in the wilderness. When you flee out of Babylon, you're not going to, uh, to Motel 6. There's no condominium and there's no Airbnb. You're going to be living in a tent for a long time, every single day. Keep going. And set under the booths. For since the days of Jesu Yeshua, mm -hmm. the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. So since they came into the promised land, that Jeshua is Joshua, the son of Nun. He's the one who led them into the promised land after Jericho. Once they came into the promised land, they forgot that they were commanded to go and dwell in booths. So they forgot. They had not kept it for all that time. And then they found it in the book of the law and they said, oh man, we're guilty. We've been chilling in the promised land and we need to get back in these tabernacles. Go ahead. And there was very great gladness. So when we have tabernacles, I'm glad for it. I can't wait. One last verse, verse 18. Also, day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of Yah. That's what we do every day at Tabernacles. Go ahead. And they kept the feast seven days. How long they keep the feast for? Seven days. Keep going. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. Amen. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to keep the feast for seven days. And on the eighth day, we will be back here for a huge party. Any other questions regarding Tabernacles? You got more? Okay. That's what we're here for. So, okay, go. Can I ask my question? Yeah, go. Okay. Uh, there is one, uh, usually when a high holy day falls on uh, the Sabbath, the Sabbath overtakes it, whatever. We stick to the Sabbath rules. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you ever got a chance to um, do some further study for the um, Day, of Atonement. Day of Atonement, because that is going to follow fall on a Sabbath. Yes. And um, in order to keep the Day of Atonement, you have to fast. You're um, afflicting yourself. And everything that the Day of Atonement is telling you to do is pretty much the opposite of what... Um, the Sabbath is because we can't fast on the Sabbath or start a fast on the mm -hmm. Sabbath. Uh, and that's what we're going to have to do to keep that is mm -hmm. we're going to have to start the sa our fast at that night. Right. At the beginning of it. Just start so, five minutes before the Sabbath starts and then you get started <laughs> on the Sabbath. But not only that, it says to afflict ourselves and we're going to come together here because we usually <laughs> don't. Uh, and we're going to come together here. And I know for my, for my daughter, like that's something that gives that's not that's not an affliction for her for her to come and see all of her friends and like we just stay home and we read so the scriptures and all that and her check our calendar because yeah. if i remember right uh oh it's because it's on the friday night that we're gathering here because normally we do not meet on the day of atonement we meet to break the fast on the day of atonement because it's usually not on a friday so because the day of atonement this year is on a friday we will be here celebrating the day of atonement or the start of the day of atonement there will be no mix and mingle there will be no water we're going to do worship give a message and then we're going to go home and continue the fast 
The Day of Atonement is the one that takes precedence over the Sabbath because there's no way you can keep the Day of Atonement without doing exactly what the Day of Atonement says. Let's take a look at that real quick. Leviticus chapter 23. Verse 26 is where we're going to start. There's a picture in here, though, uh, because when Yahawashai says, pray that your flight be not in the winter nor on the Sabbath day, that's a picture of what's happening, he says, because because that's going to be great tribulation. So imagine how much work you would have to do if the day that the abomination of desolation stood in the holy place, everyone in the world is watching the television and we all see it and we're like, it's the Sabbath. I can't ga gather nothing out of my house and put it in my vehicle. I can't start this journey. I cannot be prepared. That's why he's like, pray that it does not happen on the Sabbath. Because you fleeing to the mountains is going to require a lot of what? Work. Work. So he told us to pray about that thing. And the picture of it is here on the Day of Atonement. When he comes back, everybody thinks that it's going to be a, a glorious time. His first coming was the great day. His second coming is the terrible day. The Bible says it is a day of darkness and no light in it. So don't think you're just going to be chilling and like, oh, okay, well, let's just start gathering up our stuff. You're going to need to have already been prepared so that you can just flee. You don't have to gather anything. You just flee. Whatever you can't take, you didn't need it. In order for you to do that, you need to have put all the stuff that you needed already at the land. You're already storing those items. Amen. Leviticus chapter 23 verse. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so when, if you don't have anywhere to go yet, like you don't have that in preparation, I guess, if you will, for now, and you're starting to stock up on things, where do you put it? Like for me, I have my stuff kind of like not scattered, but like in places that I know that I'm going to go grab it, like once I need to leave. But at the same time, it's all in my house and okay. I don't have anywhere to take it yet. Yeah, I totally understand. So part one is um, making a list of what you need to get. Part two is putting those things all together. And uh, a couple months ago, I had a terrifying dream. I woke up in the morning and I called Pastor Greg. And that's the reason why I remember it, because I had to write it all down. We were all, a bunch of our members from the congregation were all at a public place. It was like a fair or something. I remember seeing like Ferris wheels and everybody was happy. And then the sky filled up with black jets. The whole sky was filled with black jets and they opened fire on the people. And all of us, and there was church members there, some people that I recognized, some people that I didn't recognize, we all scattered and began to run. And we were stuck at that place because whenever you get too many people together, there's always one thing in common. It's called a parking lot. And none of us could get out of the parking lot. So everyone is running like crazy. By the time I'm making the dream short, when I got back to my house, I was running all over my house in the different places, trying to gather up all of the stuff that I have prepared. And I went upstairs and I looked in my closet and then it felt like everything in the dream moved into slow motion because I was still looking and I was trying to figure out what pair of boots to take with me for the end of the world. I didn't already have some shoes set aside and a bag set aside and everything all in one place so that I could just get it and go. I was there just looking and you guys know I have a gang of shoes. So I'm just sitting there and I'm looking, I'm like, what am I going to take? And I woke up the next morning and it was terrifying. I woke up the next morning because of the confusion of not being prepared. I called Greg and I was telling him about it. And so I wrote the whole thing down. And since then I've been putting everything into one place. I need to be able to back up my truck to the garage, pop the garage, throw everything in the back and be out. So that's the stage that you got to be at next. You know that you need to prepare items. Now you need to put them all in a specific place. This time is coming much faster than anyone can possibly imagine. When we talk about what day it is, and I need to clear this up because in one of the videos I had spoken and said that we were living in the fifth day. That was wrong. I was not calculating that properly. What I explained is that we are living in the sixth day, but I, out of my mouth, I said the fifth day. I want you all to know that we are living at the very end of the sixth day. 
We are in year 5,995 out of 6,000. Within the next five years, we expect all of these things to be fulfilled because man was given six days to do all of his labor and the seventh day is the day of rest. Now I have a question. Okay. So when we're talking about that, it's making me think of like, okay, tribulation. So like we're looking in Leviticus back in that day, when he led them out of Egypt, was that considered a tribulation? No, that was freedom. They were captives for over 400, well, they were only captives for 210 years, but they were in, a, they were strangers in a foreign land for all that time they were being oppressed and killed. They came out of there, that exodus, that was their freedom. But they went out of the frying pan into the fire because now they're in the wilderness. There's no showers. There's no food for us. There's no all of the things that we're used to. We don't have them anymore. And they didn't have them either. And how long were they in the wilderness for? 40 years. 40 years. They were not supposed to be in the wilderness for 40 years. Why were they in the wilderness for 40 years? Disobedient. It was tripping. They tripping. That's why. 40 years okay but we don't have that luxury of walking around in the wilderness for 40 years this time he's like literally if you don't do it right this time your carcass is going to fall in the wilderness that's all there is to it you're just going to be dead so we have all of that story of the exodus to read through and say that's what i'm not going to do <laughs> i'm not going to murmur i'm not going to complain i'm not going to drag my feet i'm definitely not going to go out and work on the sabbath all of these things, all of those things come from that time period. Right. And, and the reason I was asking that, because, you know, we're looking at things to be, to resemble what's nothing new under the sun, you know, because when he did Exodus out of, out of the land, our forefathers, at that point, he provided food, things of that nature. Yeah. So we, we can't really expect that man is going to be flying out of the, out of the sky. Man, right. So we don't know what to expect. It says this day is like a day that there has never been before. No day has ever been like it. So uh, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, the, is there's this one word in the commandment that is going to be absolutely crucial once we flee to the mountains. This one word, it says, remember. What does it tell you to remember? Why? Because you're not going to be able to look at your phone and say, oh, it's Tuesday. It's Wednesday. You're not going to have no electronics anymore. You're going to have to remember when the Sabbath is. Somebody's going to have to be the timekeeper for the congregation and say, it's Tuesday, it's Wednesday, tomorrow is the Sabbath. Now, during the first Exodus, they always knew when the Sabbath was because it rained twice as much manna on that Friday night and there was none on the Sabbath day. So nobody questioned when the Sabbath was. Is the car the timekeeper? Absolutely. You better get it together. Not, not Pastor Greg, though. Pastor, Pastor Greg is Judah. He's just as dark as me. Just as lazy as I am. I'm just going to go. I have a question. Okay, so how is the, the Sabbath determined? Like, we're about the, to cover that in the verse that we're going to read right now. Okay. Let's so read this, and then if you still have the question, we'll get into it. You got some? Trying to get the box. Okay. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26. Go ahead. And the Lord and Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Mm -hmm. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. So, holy convocation, what does that mean? Yeah. We all get together. So, we are commanded to get together for the day of atonement. Go ahead. Go ahead. And you shall afflict your soul. How do I afflict my soul? Fasting. By fasting. Okay, um, we have a complete, mm, we have a complete 45 minute to an hour long breakdown specifically on the Day of Atonement. Probably two videos that shows you step by step how you do it, proves that the afflicting is done by fasting with multiple verses. We're not going to get deep into that right now. But if you need more information about it, check our YouTube channel. It says, you shall afflict your souls. Go ahead. And offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. Keep going. And you shall do no work in that same day. Does it say serve our work? It says no work at all. Okay, go ahead. For it is a day of atonement. Mm -hmm. To make an atonement for you before Elohim. Okay. Your Yah. Keep going. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not afflict it in the same day. Okay. Whatsoever soul, what part of you is your soul? 
body. your body whatsoever body your soul is not something that's living on the inside of you it's actually you okay your spirit is on the inside of you whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day the same soul no i'm sorry for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted what does that mean you know it's the day of atonement you know better but you decide not to do better i'm gonna go ahead and eat this bro ain't nobody gonna waste this food <laughs> what's it say he shall be cut off. cut off how do i say it cut off. cut off from among his people that cutting off from among your people when all of your people are wa are marching into the kingdom singing when the saints go marching in you're not going to be there with them you're going to be looking up at them from the lake of fire at the soles of their feet as they go in that's what it means to be cut cut off from among your people you're going one place they're going someplace else okay keep going and whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in the same day the same soul will i destroy from among his people if he says he's going to destroy you from among your people does it sound like you going to the kingdom of heaven you are not going to the kingdom of heaven okay verse 31 he's going to reiterate you shall do no manner of work you no shall... manner of work none whatsoever name a manner of work can't work out nope can't work out can't you can't do no dishes can't take out the trash what'd you say you cannot have relations with your with your partner that's in the book of jubilees go ahead what else you cannot fish you cannot start you can't do none of that stuff the day of atonement is a sabbath celebrated as a sabbath so it's okay that it's happening on the sabbath the only difference is the sabbath was created for the children of israel to eat and drink and be merry it's a picture of the thousand year rest with christ but until that time on the day of atonement there is no eating there's no drinking and there's no being merry amen okay watch uh keep reading that one Verse 31. You shall do no matter of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. He says, in all your dwellings. Somebody explain that. Wherever you are. So when we were in Israel, we had to keep it. When we fled into the wilderness, we had to keep it. Now that we're in Babylon, America, what? We got to keep it. Okay, keep going. Verse 32. Now it's going to give you the specifics on when it starts and it's also going to tell you when a regular sabbath starts because they are celebrated the same way here we go leviticus 23 verse 32 it shall be unto you a sabbath of rest and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at eve at even from even unto even shall ye celebrate your sabbath pause right there okay there's a whole lot packed into that one verse. It shall be unto you. Here's the interesting thing. It says, if you were to read it in Hebrew, hold your finger down on Sabbath. That's the word Shabbat. Hold your finger down on rest. That's the word Shabbathawan. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of Sabbaths. It is a high Sabbath. Does that make sense? It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest and ye shall afflict your souls and it tells you exactly when to do it why does he tell you when to do it because if you don't do it what happens to you you get cut off what if you show up late yeah oh bro that was yesterday <laughs> my bad i missed it he says now let me show you the difference because he tells you when this thing shall be go back and read line one of verse 27 line one only the first line also on the 15th day of nope, this. Nope, nope, verse 27. Read it again. 23, 27? Yep, read that. Also on the 10th day. You said 15th, right? He oh, said 15th. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it's like you. Also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Okay, when does the day start? In the evening. Let's prove that. Jump down to verse 32 and read line 2 line three in the ninth day of the month wait is it the ninth day or the tenth day you see that yeah. verse 27 told me to do it on the tenth day verse 32 was telling me to do it at the ninth day of the month at even why 
from even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. That's exactly how the Sabbath is celebrated. It starts Friday night during the evening and it ends Saturday night during the evening. Anybody who thinks, because there are some people for this reason, they think the Sabbath is only during the day. Let me tell you the reason why. There's not a single verse in the Bible that talks about the Sabbath night. It never says the Sabbath night. It always says the Sabbath day. For that reason, people who want to be very philosophical say there is no Sabbath night. You only have to celebrate it from sun up to sun down. So they only celebrate the Sabbath from the time the sun comes up on Saturday to the time the sun goes down. And that's wrong. It clearly says that this thing is a Sabbath of Sabbaths and it starts in the evening and it goes from evening to evening. And it tells me that's how I'm supposed to celebrate my Sabbath. Now, there is no Sabbath night because the evening comes before the day. Therefore, it's not the Sabbath night. It's called the Sabbath Eve. We celebrate the Sabbath Eve on Friday, the Sabbath day on Saturday morning, and it's over when the sun goes down on Saturday. Any questions on any of that? I do. Go. My question still stands. Okay. okay so, um, so how is it that it's Saturdays? Friday and Saturday, Friday night to Saturday, hmm. because from what we have, I have found, I've done some searching about this and I just haven't been able to find any clear, concise answer. So hmm. I want to know. Okay. Um, so when Passover starts, that's the first month, like that's the beginning of the month of the year, right? Beginning of the year of the, of the year. And that's the, the month of a bib, right? Yes. Okay. And so based off of that, is it the Sabbaths based off of like the fifth day in a bib or fifth or 10th day or something like that? No. So how does that work? Okay. I've explained this a bunch of times. So, uh, we have a video on our channel called prove it. And I spent about 45 minutes addressing and proving when the Sabbath is. And that video is specifically for people who use the full moon to regulate the month. Okay, let's talk about the cycles. Remember, the Most High created the sky as a clock. Okay, how many hands are on a clock? Two. What? Three. On a watch? Three. How many hands? Three. I want to buy a vow. Two or three. Okay. If there's a second hand, there's three. If there's not, there's three. Okay, there's three hands on a clock. One of them is called the short count, the middle count, and the long count. Does everybody understand that part? Okay, so we have three counts that we are working with. Which count came first? Days. Days came first. And then, and then what came? Weeks. And then what came? Months. 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 And then years. Why would I use the month to figure out what day of the week it is? At the point when the Sabbath was established, how many days had passed by? Six days, and then the seventh day was the Sabbath. Had a month passed by? No. So why would I use the first day of the month to figure out when is the first day of the week or the seventh day of the week? That doesn't make any sense, does it? That doesn't make any sense. So what these people are doing is they're finding out when the first day of the, the new moon is, and they say that's day one of the month. And regardless of what day of the week it is, they count out eight days and then they celebrate the Sabbath on the eighth day in that count. That's called the lunar Sabbath and that is wrong. The week came first. Granted, none of us were there at that time to keep track of all the days of the week. So then they'll say to you, well, how do you know that it's supposed to be on a Friday to a Saturday? Because on the Gregorian calendar, it, it's this way. Historically, all you got to do is look at one point you would say the victor gets to write history. Isn't that right? Whoever wins the battle writes history. Do you know when Rome would sack the Israelites? Saturn. On Saturn day. Saturn day. And they would say we're able to defeat them on this day because of our God whose name is Saturn. You look back through history and the Romans knew what day it was. They also knew that because it was the Sabbath, we were not going to defend ourselves. So that day, going all the way back to Rome, going all the way back to Greece, going all the way back to Babylon and Assyria has always been the seventh day of the week. It has never been changed. There's no documentation from any culture 
that says that the Sabbath is on any other day other than Saturday. Now here's the issue. When people call it Saturday, it's not on Saturday. It's on the seventh day. Does that make sense? The Saturday just happens to be the seventh day. Everybody with me so far? So don't be like, I celebrated on the Sabbath. None of the days of the week have a name. There is no Tuesday. There is no Wednesday. There's no Thursday. There's only Shabbat, right. which is the seventh day. So when do you keep your Sabbath? On the seventh day. What does that equate to on a modern day calendar? That equals up to the seventh day of the week. Even a child can figure it out. If I pull up a calendar and I say, what's the first day of the week on this calendar? Sunday. I count over there and I get to the Sabbath. Let's go back. Go back. Go back. Go through the Gregorian calendar. Go through the Julian calendar. Go back to the Hebrew calendar. It's always on the same day. The only time people think it's on a different day is when they celebrate the new moon at the wrong time. If you think that the new moon is the full moon, you're going to be all off according to the days and the times of the Most High. There that um, had me sold on the Enoch calendar and uh, the way the moon was every, or not the moon, but the um, 1159 at night would be, uh, it was in the New Jerusalem, it was, but he had it broken down to where it was uh, like, wow, that's a fact, but Jerusalem he was talking about was the modern Jerusalem, right? So it, it didn't work when I came here, remember, when I first came, it was still on the same the, time now. Yeah, it was a Wednesday. Yeah. You, you corrected me with that. Uh, right. So when scriptures. Mark first came to our church, he was completely sold that the Sabbath was on Wednesday. And I was like, it can't be on a Wednesday. It's not on a Wednesday. But when okay. I first came here, I asked Prophet to break it down so I could explain it to a three-year-old. And he said, open the calendar on your phone. What's the seventh day? That's it. If you try to make it too complicated, because Israel wants to make things complicated, and they'll say, well, we were in captivity. Okay, so in captivity, did they change any of your days? No, they didn't. Let's look at the calendar that was used uh, in 1619. Let's look at the calendar going all the way back to the time when they changed from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. They did not change the days of the week. No one can show evidence that the days of the week have been changed. The reason why we'll say, well, I don't want to do it on Saturday is because the ish celebrated on Saturday and we want to be separated from what they do. Why do they celebrate it on Saturday? Do you guys know the reason why? One is because that's the right day. How do they know? When all of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi were thrown out of the land, who was left in the land? They were left in the land. And they took over our culture and became known as us because we went into captivity and they inherited everything that we had and they became the authorities. Because if I want to find out what year it is on a Hebrew calendar, I don't go to a brother down the street. I have to go to ish person. Does that make sense? No. Okay. Sister, does that answer your question regarding the Sabbath? Kind of. You got more. Go ahead. I'm, well, I'm... Okay, so basically what was being said here is that it was based off of, um, and I understand, everything that you say makes complete sense. Amen. Um, and so going back and trying to make sure, because that, that has always been like a hiccup in my mind is that, you know, when you go to celebrate the Sabbath, you know, sundown to evening to evening, then you, you want to make sure you're doing it on the right day. And like so much, so since this has become the truth has come out in the recent days. Um, everyone has been starting to celebrate it on Saturday. But then there were more things that come out that said that, well, it's if you go back to Passover, he said, this, should, this is the start of your new month. Move, of your month. Month. Right? You're right. So it says, this shall be the first of months to you. Right. Okay, now what's the first day of the month? The first light of the moon. Right. Does that mean that that's the first day of the week automatically? No. It does not mean that. Because he said it's like the fifth day, like in the middle of like a fifth day. Okay. So like, in like, yes, it said something about a fifth day. Okay. And then he said, then you count, I think two or three days and then that'll be your Sabbath. And then from there you count another seven days to make it to 
the Sabbath of every week, and this should be your Sabbath continuing from so there. So Lunar Shabbat. The reason and why you that don't, is? yeah. If you the keep, reason why you don't, if you go to Genesis fourteen, for uh, Genesis one fourteen, sorry, the moon was create, the lights were created on the fourth day. <laughs> right. Okay, and then what? Three days later, we had a Sabbath. So you can't use the moon to tell you when you celebrate the Sabbath. You it's cannot. Impossible. It's not if possible. If you look at the moon stage on or the day of the week on every Passover. Right here. Okay. So, <laughs> I'll be doing that too. I'll be like, is so that you, young? If you Who's write talking? down what day of the week you're at on the Passover, every year it's different. So Every year. It's different. Right. Counting that to try and get your Sabbath is always going to throw you a loop because you're starting from the wrong day to count. So your Sabbaths never change? Never, ever. Always Friday evening to Saturday evening. Always. Okay. The only way that it would change is if you used the mid count, which is the month. That's our middle cycle that's going. And you said, I'm going to figure out when the first day of the month is. Okay. The first day of the month, let's say you found out that it was on a Wednesday. And you look up at the sky and there's a sliver of the moon and you count that as the first day. And then you count out from there. The Sabbath will not be on Friday night to Saturday night. Your Sabbath doing that is going to change every single month over and over and over. Right. No consistency. Right. That's the wrong count. You're using the moon to figure out. You're using the month to figure out what day of the week it is. Okay. And you can't do that because the week was created before the month. Does that make sense? And okay. the point that Pastor Greg was pulling out is the first day he said, let there be light. That was not the sun. That was the law. He didn't create the sun and the moon until day number four. So if you were using the moon to figure out what day the Sabbath is, you're never going to have enough days. You're going to go from day four, five, six, seven. Every four days you're trying to celebrate the Sabbath. That don't make no sense at all. It's not possible to calculate it that way. So if we went in reverse, we would find ourselves going all the way back, all the way back to day one, when he said, let there be light, not back to day four, when he created the moon and then trying to figure out where the Sabbath is. Okay. That Amen. makes sense. Hallelujah. Sister, if you have any questions about that, I actually, that's part of my testimony. I kept a lunar Sabbath for four years and, um, so I've studied it extensively. I'm absolutely convinced we're doing it right. And I'd be happy to share with you. What absolutely. I've I have, we started it doing Friday to Saturday. And mm. then as I was deep, digging deeper into it and trying to really figure out even more so, just to make sure, then like everything else came about. And I was like, well, maybe I'm not doing it right. And then I went back and was, ended up doing it the lunar way. Um, and that has been incredibly hard to do. I have found that to be incredibly hard to do, yeah. but now I'm trying to, like, now I'm hearing it and I'm like, okay, yes, okay. Usually we don't start the discussion of Lunar Shabbat until about 3.55. <laughs> right before, okay, watch this, go to Exodus chapter 32. Here's the issue. If we have it wrong, that's okay. You know what we're going to do? We're going to repent. When will we repent? When the angel comes and proves to us that we have it wrong. There's going to be a time, like I said, when you're not able to look at your phone. You're not going to have a calendar because you didn't grab it off the refrigerator before you fled into the wilderness. And if Issachar doesn't remember when the Sabbath is, the Most High has given us a fail safe. Watch. Exodus chapter 32, verse 34. Therefore now go. Lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Okay, so what did he say is going to happen? Mine angel shall go before thee. An angel is going to lead us out of the captivity. When the angel is there and he says, tomorrow is the Sabbath, who's going to argue with him? I don't care what day of the week it was, Proud and you're not going to remember what day it was. You are going to do the Sabbath on the day that the angel said. Why? Because he knows. Ain't that right? Okay. And if we were like, wait a minute, we just celebrated the Sabbath yesterday. But I repent because my time was wrong. And I'm willing to be obedient. There are some stiff-necked, rebellious Israelites who are going to be like, no. We're we not keeping the Sabbath when you say, 
you're not. <laughs> you right? Did. You did. You did. Remember, disobedience is a big part of the Israelite identity, unfortunately. Okay. Any other questions regarding the Sabbath? Yes. Oh. Okay. Wait, oh. oh, I'm sorry. It was You said that Leviticus 23 was a picture of praying that Yehovah Shai comes not on the Sabbath? Yes. That was, uh, that was that was for the Day of Atonement. Okay. Yeah, the Day Thank of Atonement. You. That's the precept for that is in Matthew 24, when he says, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day or in the winter. Yeah, go ahead. So back to the Day of Atonement. Yeah. Uh, we're coming Friday, mm -hmm. um, and then we're going home. Are mm -hmm. we going to be back Saturday, Saturday at 11? Take a look at our calendar. I just had it up. Too. I don't remember. You is a car. You're supposed to remember the times. So, um, if we were going to keep it, then no, we would stay home and come back uh, that night. Huh? So we would. Yeah. What? No, Friday night. We're here. Saturday. I'm not sure if we're going to be here. We might take a look. You got it. Right there. Yep. I didn't do that. Yeah, it doesn't it just says Friday, um, October eleventh at That's sundown. Right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. That's when we're doing it. It's a holy convocation. We're and commanded say, to come together. And then on Saturday, the next day. We're not coming together on Saturday. Well, okay. yeah, but within the morning, yes, we that's are. What I, that's what I was Service. asking. I yes, want to make sure that we got okay. that clear. So, okay, you're absolutely right. I'm I'm glad you did that. Because then that whole day this is this is the problem that I have with it. Yes. Like, are we going to do the day of atonement or we're going to keep the regular service yes <laughs> i don't see no problem with that it happens to fall on a sabbath right so it's the day of atonement so what we did here today so we were here last night we did worship we did all that but we had mix and mingle we're not going to have mix and mingle you're going to go home you're not going to eat you're going you're not going to watch television you're going to afflict your soul by doing the things that he finds pleasure in and when you wake up the next morning, you're going to come back into the church. Are we going to have a hangry Bible study? How, it, how it, many people have done the Day of Atonement just by a show of hands? Actually, like, yes. full. Okay. All it, right. It's not easy. It, let's, it's, but it's not supposed to be. And we're going to come here, and we're going to be together, and we're going to keep our Sabbath together. What you got? So just people, don't talk to me that day. People right? online are asking le legitimately, and I know it's a tussle. They're asking about their children. The children are going to be looking at them like, "Mom, I'm hungry." Yeah, that's. Oh, that's go ahead. A, yeah, so I deal with this. Inquiring. So I have two. Yeah, you. They are. They keep it with me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do. They don't get no exemption for this. So if you have to look at what the Day of Atonement is, the day the Day of Atonement is where. Um, I don't know if I'm going to explain this right. Go ahead. You, you are. The Day of Atonement is where you get a fresh start. Mm -hmm. the, um, you get forgiven for every. If you do this thing, you are forgiven for everything. Mm -hmm. You get a fresh start. Why wouldn't you want your kids to get that? Yeah. Amen. So that's why my kids, we endure that together. And it is something to endure because but now they're getting better. But when we first started, it was tears. All of us were crying because they were crying. I don't want my baby. She's crying, whatever. It was part of your affliction is that you're not able to feed your child. That's a big affliction. Your child is crying and they're hungry. And, and you know, in the back of your mind, you're like, it's okay. Cause when the sun goes down, we're going to eat again. But what is it preparing you for? For when you're in the wilderness and you're not able to feed your child, that's part of your affliction. I remember okay. Elijah, Elijah would go to the, I never seen him brush his teeth more times than on the day of the time. He's like <laughs> trying to get just a little bit of water off the, <laughs> that's affliction. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So do infants, in, are you including infants in this too? I'm like, not, I'm not including well, infants. Well, let's just make it reality. Okay. Well, um, those at the like suckling infants. Mm -hmm. That's why Yahweh Shai said, what he said, woe unto them that give suck in those days. He's preparing you for this thing. The Day of Atonement is a picture of preparing for this thing. <clears throat> so another dress rehearsal. The only reason we're questioning this is because we can. 
if we could not, there would be no question. If there was zero food and zero water, no one would be asking about feeding an infant or an elderly person. We would just have to do it and deal with it. The benefit is we only have to deal with it for one day. Whereas when we get to the wilderness, the day of atonement is going to be probably every other day. You are going to be afflicting and fasted and have no food because you have no choice. That's something that you should be like, I'm giving thanks for this day. I'm giving thanks for this day. Uh, I praise Yah that I don't have to do this every day. You guys know who is afflicted every day? The homeless. The homeless, they're the most prepared for the end of the world. They have no possessions that they can't leave at a, a moment's notice. They can go multiple days without eating and drinking. And you guys remember, Yahweh Shai said, foxes have places and birds have nests, but I'm homeless. The son of man hath not where to lay his head. What does that mean when you really don't have a home? I don't know where my next meal is at, but I know that Yah's going to provide a meal. That's us in the wilderness, ain't it? I don't know where my next meal is going to be at, but I know he's going to provide a meal. And even if I have to fast... Two or three days, I know he's going to provide a meal because he's a provider. Give us, this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. All right. Any other questions about that? Yes. Well, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, in the world. So, you guys, was, well, it was stated, like, if you, just like, your carcass would be, it would just drop. So, when we're in the wilderness, if we just, like, drop, are we going to get buried or just stay, be on top of the, the ground? We're going to bury yeah, we are commanded to bury our people. Okay. Yeah, so we're not just going to be like, oh, he dead, keep mashing. <laughs> keep going, we don't have time. Over. <laughs> Stepping over. No, we're okay. commanded to bury the dead. Okay, yeah. thank you. Those, when, when it's making reference to your carcass dropping in the wilderness, it's for disobedience. Yeah. Now, we're going to lose some people, and we talked about that before. Don't be scared. Everybody dies. You didn't die. You graduated. You graduated. There's no more temptation taking you. Because the people who are left behind on the earth, we have to deal with the greatest temptation of all times. Right? The mark of the beast. We're going to have to be faced with that thing and rejected. Whereas if you died, you graduated. Nobody forced you to take this thing. That's what the scripture means when it says, You have not had to resist unto blood, fighting against sin. Whoever was like, this thing is so difficult that I, it's killing me. It's not killing you. You're literally exercising your lust. You're doing what you want to do. The temptation, you're giving into it. You're not resisting unto the point where blood is being shed so that you could stop sinning. What else do we have? Oh, let's get to these onlines. Yeah, I forgot. I apologize. I forgot about y'all. We deep in here, though. Okay, go. Okay, uh, Gaspar has in Jasher 2 and 17. Uh, Lamech Cain's lineage marries Canaan's daughter Seth's lineage. Where's the precept stating that Cain isn't from Adam's seed? Okay, Jasher chapter two verse seventeen. This is in the uh, this is not in the apocrypha. Jasher is an apocryphal book. Okay, which means it is not part of the original Bible. Uh, the original Bible had 66 books plus 14. How many is that? 80. 80. The original Bible had 80 books at the time when Esdras uh, retranslated it for us. It's in the Ethiopian. It is in the Ethiopian, but I'm not Ethiopian. I'm a Hebrew. Anaya Yasharala. Okay. The Ethiopian Bible is the oldest Bible in the world, and that sounds great. Here's the problem. It's not in English. It's in gay ease, and I don't speak gay ease. But the Ethiopian Bible is thousands of years old, and it has all of our books, plus all of the apocryphal books, plus Jubilees, Jasher, Enoch, and all that stuff. What's the problem? It's in a different language. I don't speak that language. Ah, so it was never in Hebrew. It was never in Hebrew. Wow. It's always, it's an Ethiopian Bible. It's in the Ethiopian language, in gay ease. Okay, you can get a copy of it in English. It does not mean the same thing in English as it does in gay ease. It doesn't say the same thing. How do I know that? Because if you look at what it says in the King James Version versus what it says in the gay ease translation of that, it does not say or mean the same thing. So 
the wisdom will not be in you getting the oldest Bible that you can find. It'll be in you getting the only authorized word of Yah. Amen? What you doing? Just hanging out? Okay. So does that mean Jasher is not to be... It, it does not mean that. It means uh, Jasher was not included in the original translation. Okay. Now, when, when we read in, in Esdras, there was 204 books translated. Uh, the first group could be given to anybody, whether they were worthy or unworthy. The last 70 books were only to be given to the worthy. When we, and we have 80 books. That's because we have books like 1st and 2nd Corinthians. If I say it's not 1st and 2nd Corinthians, it's just Corinthians. It's not 1st and 2nd Chronicles, it's just Chronicles. That reduces me down to 70 books. And these 70 books are the books that I need to figure out how to get into the kingdom of heaven. What you're going to find a lot of in Jubilees and Jasher is history. Things that have taken place, more detailed information on different accounts. What you're going to find in the book of Enoch is information not about what takes place on the earth, but what takes place in the heavenlies. Okay? What you need to get into the kingdom is written in the 1611 version of the King James Bible. There's no commandment written in Jasher that you absolutely need to do. And you're like, oh man, it's a good thing I found this book so that now I can do it. There's not a single one. What you need is written in the book that you have. Now, the book that we have is about that thick. It's a thick old book. Spend your time reading that book. Don't be like, I think I'm going to start reading Enoch. Enoch's not going to tell you how to get to the kingdom. He's going to tell you what the kingdom is like, but he's not going to tell you how to get there. What good is it is for you to know how many gates are surrounding the kingdom if you never get in? Make sense? Now, I know everything about the kingdom, but I'm down here in this lake of fire. Please stop spending your time reading other stuff. Um, when, when the young ruler, when the young uh, lawyer came to Yahweh Shai and said, What good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Yahweh Shai did not say, Read everything you can possibly read. <laughs> he said, Thou knowest the commandments. Keep the commandments. And you find those in, these, in the books that we read from. Amen? Amen. Okay, now his question is related to the lineage of Cain. Read his question one more time because uh, the Bible makes it very explicit. And we're not going to get deep into this because this question is actually a serpent seed question. His question is what is the precept that shows that Cain is not from the lineage of Adam? Okay, now let me explain that. And we're not going super deep. Cain is not from Adam. He's not in his lineage in the Bible. Cain has his own lineage because he's something different than Adam was. Uh, can you reread his question, please? In Jasher 2 and 17, Lamech, Cain, Cain's lineage marries Canaan's daughter, Seth's lineage. Where is the precept stating that Cain isn't from Adam's seed? Everybody understand the question? Where's the precept saying that Cain is not of Adam's seed? Everyone in the world, unless you are familiar with the serpent seed doctrine, thinks that Adam and Eve gave birth to both Cain and Abel. That is not true. Okay, and like as I said, we're not going to get deep into that right now because we will be talking about that for the next whole rest of the Bible study. We have many Bible studies on the serpent seed. None. We talk. Did you? It, it doesn't say serpent seed, but we talk about it all the time. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to make one then. Okay. Jasher chapter two verse seventeen. It says, "And Lamech." The son of Methuselah. Doesn't Methuselah sound like Methuselah? Okay, because this is what Cain did. Cain, his line is the first line of counterfeits. So he goes through and names all of his children and his descendants similar or the same names that Adam named his. So there is an Enoch who's a descendant of Adam and there's an Enoch who's a descendant of Cain. There's Methuselah who's a descendant of Adam, and there's Methusael, who's a descendant of Cain. He, the counterfeits start all the way at the very beginning and run through the whole Bible. 
Okay, because Cain is not a man. He's not a descendant of Adam. He's something else. That, what you got? That Methusai L sounds like a lot of the fallen angels' names in Enoch, just the L on the end of it. Well, just, L is Yah's that, name. Oh, uh, okay. Right? So that's uh, so, anti. Wow. That's yeah, so watch. It says, And Lamech, the son of Methusael, became related to Canaan by marriage. Now, that's not the Canaan, that, that's not the Canaan of the land of Canaan. I'm going to show you who this one is. It says, and he took his two daughters and he took his two daughters for his wives. And Ada conceived and bare a son to Lamech and she called his name Jabal. Okay. So we have Jabal, we have Jubal, we have Tubal Cain. I'm going to answer his question and we're not going to dwell on it for a long time because we would have to get into the serpent seed doctrine. <clears throat> All right, let me see here. Go to Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of generations of Adam. Pause right there. What does generation mean? Huh? The regeneration of the genes. The root of the word generation is gene. This is the book of the genes of Adam. Let's read on. In the day that Yahweh created man in the likeness of Yahweh made he him. Okay, so Yahweh made Adam and he's made in the likeness of Allah. Go ahead. Verse Male two. and female created he them mm -hmm. and blessed them and called their name Adam. He called both of their name Adam. What did Adam call his wife's name? Eve. Okay, so both of them are called Adam. What does Adam mean? Man. They're mankind. Adam said, you shall be called Eve because she's the mother of all living. Okay, keep going. In the day when they were created. Okay, keep going. And Adam lived a hundred and 30 years and we got a son in his own likeness pause right there what does it say what's what's interesting about his son in this verse he uh, says he likeness. begat a son not three sons a son in his own likeness he has a son that's like him the son that he had before wasn't like him watch because this son keep reading after his image and called his name seth whoa Wait a minute, Adam, he gives birth to Seth. Uh, who's supposed to be in there? Abel. Cain and Abel. Why is Abel not in there? Because he did. Because he did. Why is Cain not in there? Because he's not. Because he's not in the image of Adam. That's why. Now let's keep reading. <laughs> and the days of Adam, <laughs> after he had begotten Seth, were eight hundred years. Okay, so we have that 800 years plus how old was he when he had him? 130. 130. So what does that give me? 930. Okay, and you guys remember what happens to him when he's 930, right? Keep reading. And he begot sons and daughters. So he's got other sons and daughters. He lived for 930 years. We're only concerned with uh, Cain, Abel, Seth. The rest of them, we don't even know their names. He had other ones, but we're not concerned with those. Okay, what happened to Abel? He got killed. What happened to Cain? He was sent out into the land of fugitiveness. So both of his sons are gone. Ain't that right? Yeah. So what happens next? He has a replacement son whose name is Seth. And Seth is in his image. Okay? Now, uh, give me verse 5, and then I'll jump to the next part. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. He did. He did. Okay, now watch this. Um, let me show you the Canaan that it's talking about. Jump down to verse 9. This is the Canaan that it, he's referring to in the verse that we uh, read in Jasher. It says, and Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan, right? Okay, so that's the one. It's not Canaan, the descendant of 
Noah, the descendant of Ham. It's not that one. Watch this. Let me find this one real quick. Can you use Genesis 4.25 as another precept for that? 4.25. You can, yep. Yeah. Okay, let's go there. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare his son and called his name Seth. For Yah, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Okay. So they so, never talk about Cain as one of their sons. That's just right. Abel and Seth. Amen. Let me find this verse real quick. That is a great precept, and it takes me right to my next point. Go to, in chapter 4, jump backwards to verse 16, and let's see what Cain's behavior is like, what he does. I want you to see that he's, he's making the counterfeits right from the top, because he, he's a tear, right? Cain is a tear. How do we know he's a tear? He killed his brother. His fruits. His fruit. Okay, watch. Okay, verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Keep going. And Cain knew his wife. Pause right there. How did he get a wife? From the other land. This is simple. How long did Adam live? 930 years. Okay, in 930 years, he has other sons and daughters. So Cain, all he has to do is wait a few years to find a woman who's a descendant of his father and that person and then somebody else is a descendant it doesn't take very long when you're gonna live for 900 years for you to find somebody to marry when you read it like this and you think wait no time has passed in verse 16 you think he went out on Tuesday and found a wife on Wednesday that's not what it says that's not what it says much time passed because at that point who was alive Adam, Eve, and Cain. Years passed. Cain is outside the presence of the Most High, but Adam and Eve are still having other children. At some point, he finds one of those children, and he has a wife now. And that's the story in Jasher. Cain knew his wife. Go ahead. Verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. That's not our Enoch. That's their Enoch. See that? That's not the seventh from Adam. That's a whole different Enoch. Keep going. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the names, after the name of his son Enoch. Okay, jump down. Uh, yeah, keep going. Verse eighteen. And unto Enoch was born Irad, mm -hmm. and Irad begat Mehu. Mahujael. Mahujael. Okay. And Mahujael begat Methuselah. Methu that's not Methuselah. Methusel. See how he slipped. That's not Methuselah. Methuselah is a descendant of Adam. Methusael is a descendant of Cain. Their names are similar because he's creating a counterfeit line. And Methusael begot Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. Give me verse 19. The first one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zalah. Zillah. Everybody with me so far? Okay, now watch this. Um... How come Cain has his own lineage? Wait a minute. So you guys know the lineage usually starts with whoever the pater is, the father of that line. How come Adam's line goes all the way back to the father? Adam's line goes down from the father to Adam to Seth. Cain's line don't go back to Adam. You guys saw that? It doesn't start there. Why? Because he's not from Adam. That's the answer to the question. What, did Adam raise, did Adam and Eve raise Cain yeah. as their own child, so to speak? Yes. Yeah. Raising Cain's. Raising Cain's. So this, so this is part of, this is part of the, uh, what, what happened in the garden, correct? This is the garden. This, this is the, the aftermath of that, right? Yes. Or the consequence. And, yes. And I have another question in regards to, like, something popped up when they were saying, so, so when uh, Cain married one of the daughters of, of Adam, that wasn't necessarily a sister. When did it, or my question is, is when did it break off to cousins? And it, it, so let's say, uh, and then you'd have to go through Jasher to get this, but let's say Adam and Eve had another child, and then that child had another child, and then that child had another child. That could all happen within a short time period. Let's say that happened within 200 years. 
400 years later, this person is so far removed from Cain that they're not even like a cousin, right? And then he marries that person. Hey, Prophet, so there's other, there's other accounts too in Enoch where the, 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 with the women, they, they changed, they changed forms after sleeping with the angels and having uh, relations with the angels. And they became uh, those, uh, yeah. So, so Eve, Definitely. how did Eve stay the same? Or did she stay the same? Or So I, I'm not familiar with anything that says that the, the women changed form after. They were still women. Okay. They're just women. Yeah. So, so that whole mermaid story the, of the, of the, uh, I forgot the name of them. Those the sirens? Sirens, yeah, sirens, yeah. Sir. Totally different subject. Totally different subject. Not related, okay. yeah. Okay, right, never mind. That will bring us into talking about unclean spirits and... Yes, sir. What? Uh, Question. Okay, yep. So, um, we so Pastor Greg says that you guys have questions and you're not sure you want to ask them. I'm so ask sorry. Them. We're having... Yes. Okay. So we were literally just discussing, like, the likeness of, um, of Yahweh and... Like in like the spirit of who he is in Abel and not in Cain. That's right. And when that was, I mean, you, that can go back to the um, when he was asking about the sacrifices. Like, why is it that my sacrifice isn't being accepted, but his is, mm -hmm. which created that jealousy and created that envy in him, mm -hmm. um, which caused him to murder. But that in itself, I mean, that tells you a lot just in that situation yeah. that tells you that his his uh, spirit wasn't even in him to begin with that's right so in jasher when it talk goes over that story um abel gives the commandment to cain he tells him this is what the um what the scriptures say or not the scriptures but this is what the word is you're because he tells him hey if you if you if um if i kill you who's gonna know who's nobody's gonna um, you know and <laughs> he and, threatened it and, first yeah abel was like hold up the most high is gonna see this and he's gonna punish you for this and he gave him the scripture or whatever it was on that and that's what caused him to kill his brother because he gave him the truth mm -hmm. and he there is no truth in him he's the serpent right. seed yeah so he murdered him <clears throat> what you got adela oh ray ray what you got oh i'm i'm we saw you partying over there when we got onto this subject. He was like, yes, uh, go ahead. So one should assume that. Uh, no assumes. No, no assumptions. No, go ahead. You can go ahead if you like. Well, well where go did ahead. Cain come from? Is he uh, a product of the serpent seed? He is the serpent seed. Oh, so. The Bible says so. I, I'm trying to remember. I don't know whether it was Jasper or Jasper where uh, this, uh, serpent used he went upstream and he bathed down upstream and uh, something about the pits, uh, something that influenced Eve to have sex with him. Is that Jasser? Or no, that's not Jasher. That's not Jasher. No. That's, what was that? Yeah, hey, I never heard that story. You never heard that one? Yeah, no. Now, is that, that he used some form of a, a witchcraft or whatever to seduce he her? He just beguiled her. And that's he what just the beguiled said. her. So yes. he didn't use anything to. to he didn't need to. Influence she her. looked at him and saw that this tree is able to make one wise. Now, right? What, what, she had. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, what, so what, whose seed is Abel from? Is he a part of a seed of so Adam? Is he? Yeah. You know, the father looked at him favorably. You coming up here? Yes. So he would have been, Abel was Adam's seed. That's why. So let me, this is the only, we're going to get I off of this subject. I knew, I knew. But I'll, let me show you why, the, what this thing says. Go to Genesis chapter 3. You got that? Okay. Genesis chapter 3, and give me verse. Whew, yeah. Verse 14, 14 and 15, and then we can hopefully change subjects. Because I don't have my watch on today. I don't even know what time it is. What, already? You going? Okay, go. And the Lord Yah said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Pause right there. What is going to happen? It's going to happen briefly. Why is he cursed above all cattle? What does the Bible say that the serpent was? He's not a snake. 
Jump backwards to verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And the serpent was more subdu subdu subtle, subtle than the beast, than than any, any beast, beast of the field. So what is the serpent? Beast. He's a beast. What is a cattle? He's also a beast. What is Baal? What does Baal look like? He's a bull. A bull is a beast. It's a cattle. It has horns. It has a, it has a long tail. It has cloven feet. Okay. So he says, so jump backwards now. Jump back down there to verse 15. Verse 16, sorry. And Yahweh Allahayim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. So he wasn't originally a serpent. He was a beast. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. If he started off as a snake, then there's no punishment because snakes go on their belly. Ain't that right? There's no punishment. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. What is he going to eat? He's going to eat dust. What, what was I made from? Dust. dust. So he's going to be trying to consume me every day of his life. Because he says to me, from, from dust until you return to the dust. Okay? Now watch. Keep going. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. What's enmity? Hate. Strife. Strife. Hatred. Variance. Go ahead. And between thy seed and her seed. Pause right there. Between thy seed, is it, is it the seed you're going to have? It says thy seed. This seed has already been conceived. Between thy seed and her seed. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the serpent. He says, I'm going to put hatred between your seed. Where's, her, where's his seed at? It's in the woman. What's also in the woman? Her seed. Does that make sense? So one of them is from Yah. The other one is from the serpent. Why would he even pull that up if what they had not if what they did didn't cause seeds to be conceived okay now watch keep going this is the reason why Cain killed Abel it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel of course you're gonna kill him you just you just were told oh when her seed comes out it's gonna bruise my head I'm gonna kill it and I'm gonna kill every single one of her seed until I find the one to that, so that I can prevent it from bruising my head. Does that make sense? Look at the next line and tell me that he's not talking about giving birth. Go ahead. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrows and thy conception. Not sorrows. Their sorrow and thy conception. Wait a minute. Why are we talking about conception if no sexual act took place? Why, why are you dro dropping that in a conversation? But when he says multiply, does that mean one? So, so there's two. You just conceived and there's more than one in there. It says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Why? You about to give birth to a serpent. One of them is a man. The other one is going to be a serpent. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. How many of you thought he was talking about way later down the line? Why is he not talking about you just did something and in sorrow you're going to bring forth those children? That's what it says. It only doesn't say that when we start adding stuff to it. Amen? He just told her straight up, you conceived and you are going to bring forth children. One of them is going to be Cain and the other one is going to be Abel. Okay, what you got? Question. It, is this a picture of um, Esau and Jacob? This is a picture of Esau and Jacob. Absolutely. Okay. What you got? Were they carried at the same time? No, they were not carried. Because According... Can you clarify that? Because when you're speaking about it, you're, it sounds as though they were, but it's not. I used to believe that they were because there is a very rare medical condition in which one woman can be impregnated by two different men. Very it's, rare. <laughs> it's hetero super fecundation. Okay, this, it is possible, but that's not what happened according to the book of Jubilees. Jubilees tells you that they were born at different times, seven years apart. Okay. Yeah. But when you're reading this story, you're thinking that this whole thing is happening at once. Like when you read this thing, you literally don't account for time. In your mind, you're saying, Yah spoke to them on Monday. Hey, don't eat any of this fruit of the tree. And then Tuesday they did it. That's not what happened. Years and years went by. 
Okay? So we're kind of thinking, and then they did it, and then you think that he came instantly. The minute they finished doing this thing, you think you're putting this whole thing into one thing instead of stretching it out over time. That's one of the benefits of reading Jubilees. It tells you how long. One of the things that we also think, we think that Adam went into the garden the first day that he was alive. That didn't happen. He had to stay outside of the garden for years and years and years, and then he was brought into the garden. So the precept is Jubilees 4.1. If you guys want to read that for yourselves of um, Cain and Abel's seven-year gap. Yeah. So there's Jubilees 4.1. Yeah. All right. I got a precept too. You got a precept? Go ahead. Proverbs 30.20. Proverbs chapter 30. <laughs> Verse 20. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and said, I have done no wickedness. Amen. Why is that a precept? Because what did Eve do? She ate the fruit. She ate it. She's an adulterous woman. She ate it, wiped her mouth and said, I did nothing. And then she had sex with the serpent? We're not getting into the serpent seed. Okay. But it, suffice it to say that Cain is the seed, the physical seed of the serpent. And the Bible says it all over the Bible. When you read the story of the tares and the wheat, Yahweh Shai says the, the, the wheat are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. He tells you straight out that's Satan's children. It is, but we're not going to get into it. Let's jump into some of these questions online. <sighs> was it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was, that was Gaspar. Okay. But I, we answered that question. Yawan wants, Yawan wants to know, can you explain the correlation between scriptures, uh, Psalms 101, I mean, I'm sorry, Psalms 110, verse 1, mm -hmm. and Hebrews 1 and 13? Absolutely. And what's the significance behind them? Very good question, Yuan. Psalms 110, verse 1. Okay. 110, verse 1 is a reading test for those that are coming to understand the different, uh, who the different entities are in the scripture. It's a reading test. Somebody read that for us, the way that it's supposed to go. Yahweh said, Unto my Adonai, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies my footstool. Okay, thy, thy footstool. footstool. Okay, so the Father said unto the Son. That's what it says. The Lord said unto my Lord. Those two lords are not the same, are they? One of them is superscript, the other one is sentence case. So David is hearing a conversation that takes place between the Father and the Son. And the Father says unto the Son, you sit down right here on my right hand for how long until i make your enemies your footstool until i put your enemies under your feet does that make sense okay now this thing we find the fulfillment of it in hebrews 10 12. chapter 10 verse 12. but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of Yah. Keep going. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. That's Yahweh Shai. So Yahweh Shai, where is he at right now? On the right, right hand. hand of the Father. After he offered himself as the final sacrifice, he sat down on the right hand of the Father, and he's going to stay there until the Father makes all of his enemies his footstool. Does everybody understand that part? I believe that answers the question, yeah? And he connects Mark 14, uh, 62 to 64. Mark 14, 62. 62? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Read it. Mark 14, 62. Yeah, I wish I said. I'm sorry, let's start this one at verse 1. This one's very powerful. I'm sorry, verse 61. But, but he held his peace and answered but, nothing okay so yahweh shai is being questioned by uh pilot right or by the chief the priests so he's being questioned by the the priests go ahead again the high priest asked him and said unto him art thou the christ the hamashiach the son of the blessed okay he asked him the high priest asked him straight out are you the messiah 
the son of the father verse 62 and Yahweh shall say I am mm. and ye shall see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven so that's an excellent precept here's the thing there are two things at the right hand of the father and these two things are one thing what is that thing the word the word there's a book Yahweh Shai is seated at the right hand of the father but when John the Revelator has to give his prophecy, he's told to go and take the book out of the right hand of him that sits on the throne. So what's there? There's a book there. There's a book of life there. And there's also the sun there. And both of those things are the same thing. In heaven, they're both the word. The word is at the right hand of the Father. Amen? Was that all of your wands? Excellent. So that's great as you're putting together those precepts you want. You got some? Go. Talk in the mic. Um, John 10, 5. Uh, we read this scripture yesterday. And I was looking for the precept for this, uh, but I'm not even sure if it's the right uh, context or uh, subject. It says, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know the voice. No, not. For they know not the voice of strangers. Mm hmm um, I was talking uh, with Darius last time we were at the land and uh, we were both coming to agreement saying that um, we don't want to learn from anybody other than an Israelite teaching this thing. That's right. And is this the precept for um, I didn't deal with anybody else. But Israel. But Israel. Absolutely okay. it is. I was looking for that. Where is that? Okay. So let me clarify some of the pieces because you're bringing them into a conversation okay. that you guys had. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Here's the issue. Uh, until the awakening of Israel happened, we were being taught the Bible by strangers, non-Israelites. And even if you had an Israelite pastor, he got taught the Bible by a stranger. He went to seminary to learn things that you can only learn by the Holy Spirit. Cemetery and school. That's the reason why they taught it wrong for so long. So Israel does not know the voice of strangers. Does that part make sense? Israel knows the voice of Israel. Israel is the prince of the peace. That's Yahweh Shai. We know the voice of Yahweh Shai and we're going to follow that voice. Everybody in this room, you ended up in here because when you heard the scriptures broken down this way, it vibrated inside of you and you're like, I understand that. I, I understand that. I can hear that. That makes sense. Some of that other stuff people be saying, you'd be like, it don't have the right vibration. You'd be like, mm, I don't believe that. Because we will not follow the voice of strangers. What you got, Adela? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Amen. So here's the interesting thing. All of the things that we preach are straight out of the scriptures. What, name the time when I sat down at the table or took the microphone and said, I think, <laughs> I think, I don't tell you guys what I think. I just tell you what the scripture says and I don't force you to believe it the way that I see it. If this gospel is hidden, it's not hidden to you. It's hidden to those that are lost. And there are some people that you try to share this with and they can't see it. Why? They're willing to follow the voice of a stranger. You're not willing to follow that voice. You're like, I need to see it straight in the word. Prove it. I don't want to hear what you got to say. Just show me what the scripture says. Amen. We have, to, we have to do that because this is the same book that they use to enslave us. Right? Oh, in our, in, in our museum, the King James Bible Muse Museum in Cape Creek, we have a, a slave Bible. The slave Bible is a specific Bible in which they have removed the entire book of Exodus from it. Why? Because you couldn't hand that Bible to no slave and tell them a story about a whole group of people rebelling against their captors. We would rise up. So there's a Bible called the slave Bible that does not have the book of Exodus in it. Right? That's, that's a strange voice right there. You taking out my instructions on what I'm supposed to do. Go ahead. Verse 4. In whom, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the of the glory of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of Yah, should shine upon them. Amen. 
So the people who can't see what we see are blinded by the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? Satan. Satan is. Okay, now watch this. So if you have been learning from a stranger, you know it's not the same. It just doesn't add up. It's not the same. If you have been learning from a stranger, stop. Learn from an Israelite. Does that mean that he needs to be so-called black or Mexican? No. If Tom starts teaching you something from the scriptures, Tom is an Israelite. He is as one born in the land. Because some of the comments that we get on our YouTube channel, there's people who will only listen to what is being said if I say it or Pastor Greg says it. When they pan around the audience and they show somebody else saying, they'll make a comment. Why do you have Gentiles in there? Why do you have strangers in there? And I'm like... They're not Gentiles. They're not strangers. And judge what's coming out of their mouth. Don't judge up? them according to the appearance. Judge what's coming out of their mouth. And where's Amen? that camera at? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> we, we 2932, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now watch this. Psalms 147, verse 19. We are going to prove that it has to be done this way. Now, just because you're learning from an Israelite does not mean that you're not going to be deceived. Right? So you still have to be careful how you hear. That's that message from yesterday. Psalm 147, verse 19. Go ahead. This was the precept you were asking about. Um, it says, he showed his world unto, word. Word unto Jacob. Who did he show his word to? Jacob. Jacob. Go ahead. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Keep going. He hath not dealt with any other nation. He hath not dealt so with any nation. Did he show his commandments and statutes to anybody else? No. Nope. Then why are you going to somebody else trying to learn something that you can only learn from an Israelite? I didn't make that up. The scripture said he hath not dealt so with any nation. Keep going. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye Yahweh. That's the reason why when you go to, I don't care whose church it is, if an Israelite ain't in their teaching, they're not going to tell you about the judgments, the statutes, and the commandments. Why? They have not known them. Hallelujah. Precept, Greg, for that is 2 Ezra uh, 3, 32. 2 Ezra chapter 3, verse 32. I just know Greg likes the apocrypha. 2 Ezra chapter 3, verse 32. Amen. I'll read this one for us. It says, Or is there any other people that knoweth thee besides Israel? Or what generation hath so believed thy covenants as Jacob? What's the answer? There is no nation that knows the Most High except for the children of Israel because they are his children. You're going to try and tell me about my father? How you sound? You live next door. All you do is see him walk out to his car. I live in the house with him. And you want to tell me about him. We're not going to have that anymore. <laughs> All right, watch this. Jump to verse 36. Second Ezra chapter 3, verse 36. Thou shalt find that Israel by name hath kept thy precepts, but not the heathen. When you go to other churches, they don't teach you precepts. The heathens don't, they never even heard the word precept. You come into an Israelite church, and that's the thing you're going to hear the most. Even people in the audience be like, I got a precept. <laughs> I got a precept. Are you the pastor? No, but I got a precept. <laughs> they think it's, they, oh, they think precepts is a different, from a different version? Yeah. All right. Let's get back to online. Um, Anastasia Dixie, uh, can you explain Isaiah uh, 2 and 11 and 2 and 17? Isaiah 2 and 11. And verse 17. Mm -hmm. 3 and 24. The lofty, mm -hmm. the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. What is the lofty look of a man? Proud. His pride. Go ahead. And the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. Bowed down. Bowed down. So any man who is of a high... Uh, position what's going to happen to him it's going to be brought low go ahead and yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day okay yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day how will he be exalted how how does yahweh receive glory glory what you say 
Every knee is going to bow. Obedience. Obedience is always the answer. I don't care what it is. What are we having for lunch? Obedience. That's always the answer. In here it is. But you know, if you go into a Christian church, what's always the answer? Jesus. Jesus. It's always the answer. Obedience is always the answer in the scriptures. Okay. And Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. What day is there when Yahweh alone is exalted? The eighth day. The eighth day. What happens on the eighth day? You guys remember, Yahweh Shai reigns for 1,000 years. At the end of the 1,000 years, what does he do? He takes the kingdom and gives it over to the Father. That the Father may be all and in all. So, Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. After the 1,000 years, you guys know a 1,000 years is not forever. Okay, so Yahweh Shai is only going to reign for a 1,000 years. The Father is going to reign forever. If Yahweh Shai was going to reign forever, then he might as well be the Most High. Is that, is that when it's made perfect for the Father? Like, as yeah. Far as so during that thousand years, we are ruling and reigning over the Gentiles that chose to remain Gentiles, and the earth is being rebuilt. And there's throughout the course of the war, there are so many bones and dead bodies that we are supervising them as they are going around and collecting the bones and burying them. Plus, Yahweh Shai has to clean out that years. pit. What'd you say? Plus, Yahweh Shai has to clean out that pit. Okay, okay. So, we are taking care of the earth for a thousand years. And then it's a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, what was her other verse? Um, there you go. Verse uh, 11 and 17? Yes. Okay, jump to 17. It says the same thing. Go ahead, somebody read it. And the loftiness of a man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low. And Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. Okay, so doesn't that verse say the same thing as the previous verse? We're not going to do it now, but when you find two verses that are like that, there's only a couple words and very small difference between the two. Analyze the scriptures in between them because it's going to point out a chiasm for you. It's going to start in one place and end in one place. And then you're looking for the precipice point, which is the key verse in that thing. That's how you identify a chiasm. Same thing at the beginning as it is at the end. You got a precept? Go ahead. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to Yahweh. Mm. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be pun unpunished. Mm, that's true. Okay. Let me explain this one. This is very important. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to Yahweh. Does he care if you're an Israelite? He don't care. He's no respecter of persons. Though hand join in hand. What does that mean? Agreement. Though the two become one, he shall not be unpunished. What does that mean? Just because you are an Israelite or just because you marry into this family, if you are proud in heart, you are still an abomination. Does that make sense? Isaiah chapter 5, verse 15. These are great precepts. Go ahead, somebody with a mic. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Amen. Read verse 16 is the conclusion of that precept. Go ahead. But Yahweh Sabaoth shall be exalted in judgment, and Yah, that is holy, shall be sanctified in righteousness. Amen. Very good precepts. Was that the end of Anastasia's question? She had one more verse. Uh, Isaiah 3 and 24. Isaiah 3, 24. Okay. Don't be surprised if you say the same thing. Uh-oh. Isaiah 3, 24. Okay. And it just, shall come to pass. Wait, wait. Hold on. Uh, we can't start it there. I'm going to explain it, and then we're going to learn it. Okay? Because the daughters of Zion, which are the women of Israel, they were the most beautiful women in the world. And what did they trust in? Their looks. So what did he do? In bonus. He cursed their looks. And there is a list of the cursings that are upon the women of Israel, specifically Judah. Start at verse 16. Moreover, Yahweh saith, 
Because the daughters of Zion are haughty mm. and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. Why are their necks stretched out? Proud. They're proud they're, and trying to they're, they're gain got, attention. Right, they're doing that. Looking down their nose at you. And wanton eyes. What is wanton? What does it mean? He was wanton. Seductive. Seductive, right? They got them lashes that are just drawing you in. <laughs> Big old butterflies on their face, Can't right? You blinking and I can feel the air off of your eyes. You, you got to cut them lashes. Them off, okay. <laughs> Watch this. Go ahead. They got wanton eyes. So their neck is stretched out. They looking at everybody with these eyes. Go ahead. No, I want wontons. Walking and mincing as they go. Wait, how are they walking and mincing as they go? What does mincing mean? They put on the performance. They're sashaying. You know our women, they can walk, right? Sashay. They can walk. Okay, Sashay. keep going. Making a tinkling with their feet. How are they tinkling with their feet? What they got on? They got on anklets. This is going to describe the Israelite woman in her beauty. So she's walking. Her That's neck is stretched out. Cool her neck is stretched out. She's sashaying and she's making a tinkling with her feet. Okay. Verse 17. Here's the punishment. Therefore, Yahweh will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. Wait a minute. What happens if you have a scab on the crown of your head? What happened to your beautiful long hair? It's about that long. <laughs> Go ahead. And Yahweh will discover their secret parts. Their, sec their secret parts is their nakedness. And he will cause them to go naked. And if you guys ever seen any of these movies like Roots or Amistad, when they paraded our, with our women and they put them on the boats, they were naked. Okay, keep going. In that day, Yahweh will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. Uh-oh. Keep going. We're not going to get super deep into this. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers. So our women normally wore chains and bracelets and mufflers. Go ahead. What's a muffler? <laughs> he said, oh, what you got? You going to Midas for that muffler? It's not that kind of muffler, huh? It's, it's a veil. veil. Yeah. Oh. It's a veil. It covered her face. It gave some mystique to her. Right? Women of Israel, they would cover their face. Not so much their head, but their face. And the proof of that is um, when Rebecca, when uh, Isaac's servant went to fetch Rebecca. She's walking, she's on the horse and he's on the ground. And then when she sees her husband, when her husband to be, she covers herself with the veil. She doesn't say she covered her hair, she covered her face to add some mystique to her. Okay, keep going. The bonnet. What's a bonnet? It's, it's, a, a, head. Head. it's a head covering. Okay, go ahead. And the ornaments of legs. What you got on your legs, girl? Go ahead. And the headbands. You got them fresh headbands. Look, all of this is the adornment of an Israelite woman. This is the stuff that they used to wear to beautify themselves. Go ahead. And the iPads and the earrings. <laughs> he said the iPads. Not the, and the tablets and the earrings. Go ahead. The rings and nose jewels. Oh, our women wear nose jewels. So anybody who tells you that you can't have a piercing is a liar. Oh, you got your nose pierced? So did the women of Israel. Keep going. The changeable suits of apparel. Wait, they had a closet full of clothes. And Keep the going. mantles. Uh-huh. And the wimples. Uh-huh. And the crisping pins. We're not going to get into the definition of all of those things right now. If you hold your finger down, it's going to tell you it's all different clothing and adornment items. Sashes and all kinds of stuff. Give me verse 23. The glasses. Wait, the, the sun, the shades. She liked to rock them shades so that she can hide her eyes. Go ahead. And the fine linen. Uh-huh. And the hoods and the veils. Keep going. And it shall come to pass. That instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Uh-oh. Now, this is the verse that she was asking about. Why is this happening to the children of Israel? Disobedience. 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 They used to come in here smelling like frankincense and myrrh. And, and now what it smell like? Ooh. Stink. Stink. Sweat. It smells like you were at the bottom of a boat on a trip from West Africa to Virginia. And you haven't showered in that long. Right? Ah, okay, keep going. And instead of a girdle, a rent. Uh-huh, a rip. Go ahead. And instead of a well-set hair, baldness. Uh-oh. Keep going. And instead of a stomacher. What's a stomacher? A girdle. Girdle. Go ahead. A girding of staff cloth. The only thing that we could make clothing out of when we were in slavery was whatever was left over. Basically, leftovers is, is the culture of slaves. 
all of the food that we ate, the reason why we had to eat the intestines and the pig's feet and all of those things is those were what was left over, right? We, we were clothed in sackcloth because that was what was left over from them doing their agricultural work. We would just take a bag, cut a hole in it, cut some arms in it, pull it on and wear it, right? Everything was leftovers. One last line in there. And burning instead of beauty. That burning is envious, is enviousness of every other woman. Instead of Israelite women recognizing their own beauty, they look at other people's beauty and say, I want to be like that. Amen. That's the answer to that question. You got something? Yeah, I was just going to uh, ask. You said the, the nose were okay, but was what happened in 24 because of all the adornments that they were doing, the switching, the no, so flashes, it wasn't be, the nose ring? It wasn't because of the adornments. Right. The women were filled with adornments. Right. That's like the, the Israelite woman is supposed to be the most beautiful woman in the world. But she started trusting in all of her adornments. That's the reason why the Bible, when it, let me show you the preset for this. Okay. So it's not because they were doing that. Um, he took those things away because of their disobedience. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. That kind of goes in with the pride that they were talking about in the last two verses she asked about. Mm -hmm. right? The pride. Absolutely. For you remember, brethren. No, no. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. In like manner, also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with okay. shamefacedness, uh -huh. and sobriety, not with broidered hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array. Now we understand the reason why he says that this is modest apparel. Not for you to be decked out with your chains and your sunglasses and all this stuff. Because he tells you what that looks like. When you put on a whole bunch of stuff trying to make yourself beautiful on the outside. Read verse 10. It says, But which become with women, professing godliness with good works okay so there's a parenthesis in the middle of that sentence separate the parentheses and then read the sentence without the parentheses so it says but with good work that's right so what should a woman be adorned with good works, good works. and what is it when the woman has them when they're putting on non-modest apparel and they're not shamefaced which means they look prideful and they're not sober they got their hair braided they're wearing all kinds of gold and pearls and costly array which becometh women professing godliness. If you can describe it quickly, what would be modest apparel? At a quick answer. Okay, what does modest mean? The opposite of seductive. Hold your finger down. I'm surprised nobody said hold your finger down. Hold your finger down on the word modest. Go to the Strong's definition. Orderly. It doesn't mean what we think it means. Ridiculous. We think that in order for a woman to be modest, she needs to be covered from head to foot, not showing any skin. Isn't that right? That's what most people think, especially in like the Islamic culture. They wrap her up like a burrito. Right? You know she hot under all that clothes. What does it say here? In its primary sense, orderly, that is decorous, of good behavior, modest, well-arranged, seemly, modest okay so if a woman walked in here right now and she looks like she's going to the beach to the beach would what she's wearing be appropriate no sir absolutely not why because it's not appropriate for where she is it's not seemly here but it's the same way if i went to the beach and i had on a trench coat i'm also not being modest because the clothing is not appropriate for the environment does that make sense now, if all of us decide that we are going to the beach, is it a problem for a woman to wear the attire that, is, that you use to go into the water with? No, that's appropriate for the place. However, if her curves are causing men to lust, then she might want to make it more appropriate considering somebody else's situation. Does that make sense? Okay, if the man begins to lust after her, whose problem is it? Hers or his? It's his. It's his problem. Is there anybody who thinks that it's her problem? The way that she is shaped, 
Now, the clothing that she can decide to wear, that can create a problem for a man. But the shape of this woman's body and her hair and her eyes, whatever natural beauty she has, if a man lusts after that, is it her problem or his problem? Okay, that is very important to understand. Because modest means appropriately dressed. That's all it really means. What you got? Exodus chapter 33. 33 verse 5 and 6. For Yahweh saith unto Moses, Say unto the children of Yasharel, Ye are the stiff necked people. You are a stiff necked people. Go ahead. I will come up, I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment mm. and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know that 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 I may know what to do unto thee. Keep going. And the children of Yasharel stripped themselves of the ornaments by the Mount Horeb. So when we put on all of these ornaments, ornaments are adoring, adorning, right? So if I put on a, a necklace, like I got my bling bling and my watch and all this stuff, it's, it's professing godliness. It's, it's basically you're showing that you're of a higher stature. When you humble yourself, you got to take all that stuff off. And the Most High humbled the children of Israel by stripping those things from them. Now, we try to profess godliness by going out, getting those things and putting them back on. Whereas that's not what makes you look godly. Go back to the scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at it one more time. Look at verse 8. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now look at verse 9. So that's what he says. Men ought to be praying. That's what's going to make you godly. Is you're getting the answer from Yah. Okay? You're not afraid to pray about everything. In like manner also, in, in, in like what manner? That women also do the same thing that he just described, which is pray everywhere about everything. That women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. What's another word for shamefacedness? Humble. Humility. Humility. What's another word for sobriety? Sound, sound mind. Sound mind. That's perfect. Okay. Not with broidered hair. Why? So is this saying that a woman shouldn't braid her hair? It's not saying that. What is it saying? She shouldn't use that to make herself look godly. She shouldn't be doing that to get attention. The attention that she wants is going to come from the man who realizes she prays everywhere about everything. That's the kind of woman that you should be looking for. Not the one who's like, oh, you got long braids down your back looking like Beyonce so what do you pray about everything because there's going to be some problems that your braids is not going to help us get through but your prayers might help us get through these problems amen got a precept. precept go ahead Matthew 23 25 Matthew 23 25 it reads one to you scribes and Pharisees you hypocrites for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter but within they are full of extortion and excess. Amen. That's a great precept. That's also related to judging according to the appearance. And we're not supposed to, like, if, for, for the single men out here, we're not supposed to be judging according to the appearance. And what is the appearance when you're looking at a woman? What her hair look like? What her toes look like? She can't handle hammer toes, bro. She can't, she can't handle hammer toes, right? Uh, you're judging according to what she looks like. You're supposed to be judging, judging according to how she reverences the Most High. Yeah. Because her relationship with you should be a mirror image of her relationship with the Most High. Your relationship with her is a mirror image of your relationship with the Most High. Do unto her as you would have her do unto you. Amen? Yeah. Go. Completely separate. Completely separate. Good, because we're wrapping up. Cool. Uh, what are children allowed to do on the Sabbath? What are children allowed to do on the Sabbath? That's a good question. Help him out. Please and thank you. The same thing you do. Exactly. Right. Same you, thing you do. What do you do on the Sabbath? 
Wow. Rest. I, I don't play video games. Okay. okay, they're not allowed to play video games. We don't watch fun movies. Say that one more time. I don't watch fun movies. Okay, uh, you don't watch movies. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So watch. <laughs> you telling me, and then now you asking me. I ain't torture my baby for no reason. It's not. It's not torture. Yeah. It's go to Isaiah chapter fifty-eight. Now your grievous. question is. It answers itself because it says, what are children allowed to do on the Sabbath? Your children are allowed to do the same thing that the children of Israel are allowed to do on the Sabbath. We're all children. There's not different rules based on how old you are. We're all children being obedient to our father on the Sabbath. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. Go ahead. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. When it says turn away your foot, he's going to explain what that means. Go ahead from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. So it's not telling you to turn away from the Sabbath. It says turn your foot away from doing your pleasure on the Sabbath. Go ahead. And call the Sabbath a delight. What's the Sabbath? It's Riff. a delight. It's a delight. Go ahead. The, the holy of Yahweh. Uh-huh. Honorable. Uh-huh. And shalt honor him. Keep going. Not doing thine own ways. Uh-oh. Not watching those fun movies. That's what that said. Nor finding thine own pleasure. No. Not. For me. Not making beats nor right. speaking thine own words uh, i'm not even writing my raps on the sabbath all right okay thank you we are fellowshipping together and having a blast as we are supposed to do resting and playing with the most high yeah amen you got something you look like you got five things go ahead she got at least five things <laughs> i'm so sorry i Lots of questions come up because this is the first time I've had an opportunity to like sit down and like ask my questions and okay. get like true teaching. So Amen. I'm Amen. really excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that being said, my children are what two, three and five. They're about to be three and five, mm -hmm. and I have never really known what to do with them on the Sabbath because they're very high energy. Mm -hmm. And so normally, what we do, we like we do watch Bible stories and like, mm -hmm. I allow them to like, we'll, we'll do like what they call a concert. So we'll put on praise and worship music and we'll sing and we'll do all the things. That's awesome. <laughs> and so I want to make sure that like, I don't necessarily, like, I don't know what else to do other than that. If that makes sense. Because that sounds like his pleasure, not theirs. Yeah, that is his pleasure. Okay. So the children of Israel, we are just creative by nature. Just be creative with the word. Do, do something, do anything. Right, get some flashcards, take one scripture, write one word on each scripture, lay it down on the floor and get them to, arre to arrange it in the right order to the scripture makes sense. It might take them an hour to do that, but they're going to be actively working in the scriptures. And you being creative, figuring out ways for, to keep them busy doing the things of Yah on the Sabbath. What you got, Jermaine? Um, so I was just referencing when I asked you the other day about... Um, going like to give out to the homeless and all that because mm -hmm. me and prophet used to do events on on the sabbath and he explained to me that it's okay to do good on the sabbath so even doing outreach with them or like just giving mm -hmm. back to the community but preparing the day before amen amen that's good anybody else got anything let's is there i know there's a lot of questions online that we just 414 someone someone just simply asked her husband and her are together they don't really have anyone else around can they baptize each other <clears throat> the answer is yes the answer is yes do they know the names and so you can't um, you can't baptize what's, them Go ahead. Sorry, what's sorry. their what's their name because they messaged me it's, and it's i rosemary and she's been on here for a while yeah, yeah. so they're a Jenkins. part of the group they're oh they're watching Georgia? our teaching okay. and all that stuff so um we are making arrangements to be able to help you with baptizing. Please be patient. I know it's taking some time, but this is something that's very important. And we don't want to do our own thing in this. And we want to make sure that we're obedient to the Most High. And it just takes time to get all this stuff planning. Especially, and we're talking about multiple states. Yes. It takes time. A scenario just popped into my mind. I want you to imagine that. Uh, put our, all of ourselves in the time of the apostles. There's no internet. And <clears throat> uh, someone was visiting in Jerusalem and they saw Paul baptize someone. 
and but this person is of another nation so let's just say that they spoke a different language and Paul is baptizing and he baptizes this person in the name and the the bystander saw what he did and then he went back home and tried to do the same thing but didn't know the names would it be a baptism no it would not so that's that's the reason why I'm like do they know the names they have to know the names and you have to receive the teaching. There is a pre-baptism and a post-baptism requirement. What is the pre? Before I baptize you, what do I have to do? I have to teach you. The scripture says, go ye therefore and teach, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So the answer is yes, but it's also no. You need to be able to fulfill all of those requirements. Amen. Amen. Um, Antonia's question. I think it's the one about, um, I answered it, but I want to make sure it's the one she was asking if you already have a place in the mountains. She was asking if you, if someone already has a place in the mountains, do they flee? Do they flee now? At all. Is that the question? Yeah. Right. At once. If they live in the mountains already, do they flee? You already fleed. If you live, my right. brother Mike and Elizabeth, they already fleed yeah. <laughs> years ago. The purpose of fleeing is to get out of the to city. To get out of it. That's right. To get out of the city. I didn't, I didn't so. ask it because the answer was given that uh, if, yeah. if, if the whole purpose is to get out of the city, yeah. to go to the mountains. So Correct. They're already in the mountains. They don't need to get out of the city. So I just wanted to bring that. I, I, I had answered the question. I just wanted to bring it up in case because she said someone from the group had asked the question so just in case if you do have that question if you already have a place in the mountains and you live there just welcome us when we get there uh, you're yeah. already there amen. Come to your house amen amen who knows look we, we are gonna have to leave from arizona oh, at some point yeah that's what i've been telling people too so yes if you got a place in another state and you are fleeing there expect that prophecy ministries is going to be rolling through there in a couple of through. years send that address <laughs> <laughs> send the address look we starting off in arizona then we're going to hit new mexico it's an israelite tour what are y'all doing we just mobbing it's a second exodus <laughs> All right. One Any? La oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have one last question. Yes, please. Okay. So you said that there was a pre-baptism and a post-baptism requirement. Requirements. Yes. Right? Um, I've never heard of that one before. Okay. And I, I just quoted it, but let me show it to you real quick. Okay. Matthew chapter twenty-eight, verse nineteen. Matthew twenty-eight, verse nineteen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's the post baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the baptism. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's the post. What do I do first? Teach. There's no reason for this person to want to get baptized unless I teach them what baptism is. And most people are confused about baptism because they think they're being baptized into his life. That's not what the scripture says. You're baptized into his death. So when you get baptized, you're baptized into his death. Okay, so I need to teach you, and then I need to dip you, and then I pull you up out the water, and I continue teaching you until he returns. So Amen. with Christianity, as most people have been, quote unquote, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like, so that's not the true baptism. You just got titles. Those are... Okay, so Those are titles. Those are titles. Those yeah. are not, like, the true names. Okay. So that's a counterfeit. Okay. And so then, since I was baptized in that, and I want to... So real quick, okay. you were never baptized. You just got uh, wet. You just, you just got wet. You I got understand. dipped. I got dipped in water. The instruction is very clear, right? right? It says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right. If the person doesn't know the name of the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost, are they qualified to baptize you? No. No, they are not. And if they say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and they put you in the water, but they don't tell you the Father's name, that is a counterfeit baptism. And people live with that their whole lives, thinking that they got brought into the family. So then if I want, well, I do want to be officially baptized then. Okay. Like, officially. And Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, we, um, and I wanted to know, like, the, what I needed to do to do so. Amen. Um, if you had told us before you came, we would have done it today. 
Uh, yes. I mean, I was going to, but then I oh. wasn't going to because my husband oh. wasn't going to be here, okay. and I wanted him to be here with me. Make a plan with your husband, and okay. let us know when you're coming back, and we will perform the baptism. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are planning on doing some, the 28th after Bible study on a Wednesday evening. The 28th? We are? All the moms come into town. Oh, that's right. Okay, that's a, that's a big day. And then also, we are doing baptisms in, at the lake in Tabernacles. So that's a big part of Tabernacles is, yeah. yeah. And, and also on Sunday, next weekend, we will be doing, wait, no, no, is it? Next weekend? Friday, Saturday. Yes, for Friday, the marriage Saturday, Saturday, we were also doing baptisms. Yeah, because people are coming in. Not on time. Sunday, though. Not on Sunday. That was yeah. my fault. Yeah, not yeah. Sunday. Speaking Friday night Sunday. and Saturday, we will be doing baptisms during the remarriage. Go ahead. Do we need to get some decorations together for that? For the remarriage? We're working on that, but yes. All right, any other last minute questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, real quick, on the last, on the last Matthew 28, 19, yes. um, when, it's, when he says, go ye therefore and teach, um, I held down teach, and then the, uh, hmm. and then the there's definition, um, column 1A, it says to follow his precepts and instructions. So Amen. To point, to point that yeah, out. Thayer's 1A, to follow his precepts and instructions. That is the definition of teach. Amen. That's good. Hallelujah. Anybody, anything else? You're here. You can I ask mean, him why you're here. Like, I'm you're here. here. Like, <laughs> That's right. Are you guys, you guys are staying for the, are you guys leaving right away or are you going to do the hang? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to be leaving after this. Okay. Um, but you don't live that far, though. You can you can come visit us again, yeah? Right. Okay. I live about, it's like an hour and ten minutes. Okay. Drive. Oh, you should hang out. That ain't far. <laughs> Look, a lady, a lady drove seven hours You're right. on You're Wednesday right. to get here to spend two hours with us. Okay. You know what? No excuses. <laughs> No excuses. Okay, I, no excuses. That's what I'm talking about. I hear you. No excuses. You should hang out and come uh, kick it with us all tonight, too. Yeah, see? That's what I was asking, because we're doing, like, uh, and when the sun goes down, we're going to be going to, it's your guys' house tonight. We're going to Tom's house, and we're all just going to hang out and eat and fellowship. So it It's like this, but great. informal. Informal. Yes. Okay. It's informal, okay. yeah. We spend a lot of time together. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's so good. Okay. My last question, okay. and this will be the end of my question. I bet she have another question after this. She got one. another we question. Have, we had a list. Okay. <laughs> you have a list? We have a list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so in regards to a woman in modern day becoming clean after her cycle, mm. like how do we go about that? Like, because you can't, like, how, do, how does that work? Because, I mean, it says to, you know, be clean, like, as far as, like, taking care of your hygiene and all the mm -hmm. things, right? Um, but that's not says, the same as the clean in the Bible. Right, exactly. The woman's hygiene. And so that's what I, that's what I want clarification on. Mm. And, like, how to make sure that you're not passing that uncleanness yeah. to others. Okay. Go. John 15, 3. Yep, perfect. John chapter 15, verse 3. Now you are clean. Through the word which I have spoken unto you. That's all it says, right? When am I clean? Right now. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Okay, now let's explain what that means. The children of Israel are in captivity. These laws regarding cleanin cleanliness, like when it, has, when it deals with a woman and her flowers, or touching a dead body, or any of those things, we weren't in captivity at that time. So you may not have another room or another house where the woman can be separate during the time of her uncleanness when you're living in captivity. That may not be an option for you. Because one of those laws says anything that she sits on or touches is also unclean. Right. Okay. So what you going to do? Kick her out of... You got to be in the garage for the next week. Whole other house she got to go to. Yeah. You just gone out there. Okay, that's grievous. If it, that's grievous, the keeping of that commandment. We may have to do that when we get into the wilderness. The women may have to be set aside. The angel will let us know. However, this scripture says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So what does that mean? You are clean. Amen? Amen. Any other ones? Okay. Let us, uh, so again, tonight our fellowship is at Tom and Jessica's house when the sun goes down. Food theme? Asian 
Asian food, Asian food, and we will be hanging out there. Um, for those that are planning, let me just real quick, because we're all here together. Uh, if you're going to the porch tomorrow, please raise hands. Porch tomorrow, yes. Okay, keep, keep your hand up if you're coming back the same night. Okay? You guys all need to come back. So then you, the people that are coming back the same night need to coordinate. Okay? Because I'm staying over. Pastor Greg is staying over. I know Brother Jesse is also coming back the same night. The porch is our land up north where we're going to be doing some work. So uh, we need as many hands on deck as we possibly can because Tabernacles is coming soon. And there's a lot of work to do. So if you're coming back the same night, coordinate with somebody else who had their hand up. So I just want to uh, say really quick about Tabernacles. There is a lot of people coming. How many are sold already? Uh, I don't even know. But one we're, family. And we're close one to 100. Family, there's 17 people with just one family that yeah. are coming from out of town. Yeah. We have a lot to, of work to do. So from here on out, that's what we're doing is we're working on the porch. Yeah. So if you can get some time off, if you can do it, we need all hands on deck for this thing. I don't our, think we had 17 people last year. Probably, probably about that many. Probably about that many. We we go up every other Sunday, um, and we stay overnight till Monday. So if you're able to work with that schedule, let us somebody know. Usually, somebody will come back the same night. It's about three and a half hours from here. So, so it was last week, and we're doing another one this week. Is it again next week? Or no, it it's not next from... week because it's the Israelite remarriage next week. Perfect. Yeah. Any other questions regarding that information or anything else that needs to be discovered or discussed? Let us pray then and wrap it up. Somebody with a mic. Father, thank you for another opportunity to spend time with you. Father, thank you for your word today. Father, thank you for the way you're moving, Father, in every single life. Father, I appreciate your, your mercy, your grace, your love. Um, I will allow us to continue to walk with you, Father. Please allow us the privilege to to hear your voice and see you in all matters, y'all. Father, we lift up everyone online, Father, all those, all those that are sick in body, sick in mind, Father. Father, I pray that you would meet them in their place, y'all, and I ask, Father, that you would grant them healing, grant them a cure and relief, Father. Father, from whatever it is that oppresses them. Father, allow us to be free from all bondages, all strongholds, Father, please, in the name of your Abishai. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your guidance, Father. Bless you, Most High. Thank you. Father, Shem, Yahweh Amen. 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 Thank you for being here.